you said, um, uh -oh. I think you said socialism will never prevail, and also <laughs> that I'm dumb on Twitter. Care to explain? Yes, I'll those also are give my your exact pronouns words. and name. Give your pronouns and name to chat before they get mad at me. Yes, yes. Um, I, I also called you a socialist lib cuck at the mm -hmm. same time. Somehow you can be both of those things. I feel like um, I'm it's been known. No, so. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, so, okay, so let me get uh, this straight. I am This Stefan dude is capable of solving ethics, but he can't solve that ye ass hairline. Get the fuck out of here, dude. Okay, dude, I wouldn't trust this guy to make my fucking sandwich. Fucking nerd. Okay. Wait, what is happening? Bro! Him pronouns um, in terms of an introduction. Um, you know, if you, if uh, what I do after I finish graduate school, mostly economics and finance focused, did poli sci undergrad as well. Uh, decided that had a hell of a lot of free time after finishing school, so figured I'd get into making sort of educational videos, uh, video essays on YouTube. I also do debates and stuff. So uh, if you've ever had any sort of questions like you okay. know, what, what okay. should the corporate tax be what's the stock market what's quantitative easing um you know my my youtube videos on the account boy channel would probably be helpful enough and i i do a lot of capitalism versus okay. socialism okay uh videos and debates as well okay and um i take it your position is that the corporate tax rate should be 100 percent look i you know that's probably too extreme i would say 90 percent maybe Give 10% to the corporations, but, you know, 100% is a little extreme for my taste. Wait, wh who is this guy? Wait, what? Um, IGM forum, corporate tech. Just to be clear, I'm pretty sure it's like... Let me check. Hold on. Just to make sure I'm not making bullshit up. This has to do with tax rate harmonization. Um, fuck, I need to find sources for this. I can bring this up in the future. Um, I, I, I don't think that technically, oh, they're just joking around, don't worry about it. The difference has become much more salient later on. Oh, okay, maybe. I've, just, I've always heard like so much shit talk about corporate tax rates. I've just heard that there's such a garbage way to tax things. Just raise the income tax or raise the capital gains tax. These are like, you have like two huge tools to like tax the fuck out of people. Corporate tax, or not corporate, income taxes and um, and uh, capital gains taxes. I might have said corporate before, sorry. Income tax, capital gains tax. Bring those two up and go big. Why is corporate tax bad? Because it's just, it's such a weird way to try to get money out of a company. Like, if my company makes money, um, why, why are you taxing it? Like, once I start to pay that out in the form of wages and shit, then okay, like, now you can start taxing people. And it works better that way anyway, right? Like, why would you, um, I just... I don't, I don't understand the I don't understand the rationale for taxing uh, corporate profits like just tax them when they're paid out or when shares are given out or whatever like not shares are given out when the when the gains are realized but yeah Vosh literally control V this take on corporate taxes at destiny oh, okay not surprising okay gotcha why do so many countries have corporate taxes I don't know it's I think they're politically popular probably like it sounds good to tax corporations but All right, I'll forgive your I'll forgive your liberalism uh, for now. We'll we'll see how it pans out. Okay, right. so I got in hot water, and I'm using that almost with a sort of mocking sarcasm when I say that um, for saying that um, social democracies are still imperialist and still rely on economic inequality in order to produce their outcomes. Uh, some people didn't like that, uh, so I called them all libs and banned them. What do you what do you take? <laughs> do you have anything you'd like to say before I call you a lib and ban you? Well, you know, uh, uh, what I would say is that um, please don't ban me uh, because, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm one of the good ones. Uh, but what I would say in regard to uh, Nordic countries and social, you know, sort of the, the bastions of social democracy that are held up by by social democrats uh, is that uh, it is true to a certain extent their economies rely on, uh, you could say, unequal exchange, labor exploitation, and in the third world, 
Um, but the reality is, is that this percentage is, is, is relatively small. And so the prospect of reforming uh, the, those supply chains and those systems under a capitalist framework is, is actually fairly feasible in today's uh, context. Um, all right. Uh, there are a couple of angles we can take this from. I guess the first question that I would like answered is why would they reform that? Well, I mean, it's it's similar to like why would someone buy an electric car today, right? I mean, people um, people's priorities change over time. Uh, there was actually recently the Economist. Where is um, where's that fucker Irk at? I think um, there's a study post on the uh, Economic Research Bureau, whatever. You, um, it's like ERBN. Fuck, what's it called? Um, where. I thought it was demonstrated. This is just one study, so maybe not the best. But I thought they demonstrated that um, corporations preferred stable countries to countries with cheaper labor. That there was, even if there's some country where you could exploit the fuck out of the workers, you tended to prefer the more stable countries where the workers are paid more because there was less of a chance of like political turmoil that would result in like Insulin. the expropriation of your property or just political turmoil that would fuck over like your other like economic productivity in your, oh, NBER, sorry, your uh, National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, yeah, or other forms of like economic uncertainties that will fuck your shit up basically. And that corporations were, corporations were willing to pay a premium on, um, on that. Uh, let's see if we can find this real quick. I don't like to say shit nowadays and not justify it. <clears throat> Multinationals' wages and working conditions in developing countries. Maybe it was this. Do multinational firms exploit workers in poor nations? The effect of multinational production on wages and working conditions in developing countries. Um, this was presented, this paper was in 2002. Um, these three authors offer a resounding no. Indeed, the authors conclude that there is virtually no careful and systematic evidence demonstrating that multinational firms adversely affect their workers, provide incentives to worsen working conditions, pay lower wages than in alternative employment, or repress worker rights. In fact, they argue that the opposite is true. Um... In September 2000, a group of economists, including Deridoff and Stern, formed the Economic Consortium on International Trade. It circulated a letter to presidents of 600 academic institutions, urging that greater attention be given to the possibility of mandating codes of conduct. Blah, blah. <laughs> this is like a summary of the paper. I feel. I think I read the. I want to say in the paper itself. Um. Argued that like. Countries that were fucked that you might have access to cheap labor on or whatever is, um, yeah, because of the instability of the country, there's other like economic, like lack of productivity that exists there. So they wouldn't opt for those countries, but man, man okay. I, we found something. This is the paper itself. I wonder if I made that part up. <laughs> this evidence indicates that multinational firms routinely provide higher wages and better working conditions than their local counterparts and that they are typically not attracted preferentially to countries with weak labor standards. Introduction, political economy. I think that's a preprint. Shut the fuck up. It is a working paper, though. I don't know if this was published. It might be the case that this was never published either, which we wouldn't suck. But... Okay. All right. I believe working paper is a preprint, right? It's essentially the same thing. This was the issue with businesses moving to Mexico. They have strong labor standards by the Mexican GOV, but not enough power to enforce them, maybe. Just released a... Uh, a video they do maybe I don't I don't want to say weekly maybe every other week they do videos and uh, this uh, video was called like uh, too woke or too broke or something like that and uh, they talked about the changing investment mindset the idea that uh, corporations are becoming increasingly pressured to be more socially conscious and so uh, there's sort of a ground up ability for that to happen and, and trickle into governments and corporations as well but uh, overall though I, I think that that would be my answer that uh, people are becoming more societally conscious as the world becomes more globalized and the information age takes 
uh, takes on maturity. Uh, and so people are going to want to see those uh, those reforms. I mean, for instance, even in, um, I, I want to say there are countries that are looking at proposal and maybe a few countries have already banned, uh, you know, things like, uh, like slave labor from supply chains or uh, getting, like taking goods from Xinjiang region, things like that. So I think the prospect of what I'm talking about isn't totally unfeasible at least i would say it's more feasible than a global socialist revolution true right well i don't think um i don't think a global socialist revolution is ever happening to necessarily tomorrow true well, i'm only tomorrow. saying that as a capitalist ec economic system social democracies are still going to rely fundamentally on many of the inequalities that have we've propagated um uh, uh you know to supply our business interests so, like, with regards to Norway's imports, I, I just take Norway. There are, like, a dozen countries we could use, but Norway is the one that I've been looking at a little more than others. Um, for sure. Right. Now, I understand they get a lot of their stuff domestically, and their economy is sourced more ethically than the United States is, for sure. But Do it still really seems that? like, I mean, if you were to cut out all trade, all imports from like the third world or the developing world, I mean, the real Norway, question, like what is he going to do once he starts balding? In dead water. And it just, it seems like the only way to, to extricate yourself from that would be to economically cripple yourself by refusing to trade at all with like a significant portion of, of the exports produced in the world, you know? Wow. Um, so I, the narrative from what you're saying makes, you know, it, it, narratively it makes sense, it's logical, but the issue is that it's not really necessarily bore out in the numbers. Yes, so, thank you. God! Uh, for thank instance, you. there was uh, a really good, and it's it's quite an extreme paper in terms of the hypothetical that they uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, take take on in the paper. Um, a couple economists, one from MIT, one from Berkeley, um, what they tried to answer was, uh, take the U.S. as an example. Uh, what if the U.S. just stopped trading? Just every single good and service that... Uh, people might want, uh, they would have to get it domestically or they couldn't have it. You know, what effect would this have if the U.S. basically embargoed the rest of the world uh, in terms of Im importing goods? And that's including the global north countries, global south countries, rich and poor countries, mineral wealth, uh, mineral rich. Someone link Vosh post-debate molding? Wait, what? Destiny, you say tax it when they pay out income. Don't corporate taxes increase those payout expenditures because they You're avoid because they avoid a corporate tax rate by hey, spending spouse. the money in the corporation and taking that as deductions. Every investment they make that is deductible is taxed somehow. No, corporate tax incentivization incentivizes Amazon to raise wages, deductible, etc. That's all then taxed. Well, the um, the incentivization for companies to reinvest money shouldn't necessarily just come from like aggressive tax policy. It should come from there being profitable um, profitable projects to invest their money into. Like it's not like if you took all of your um, it's not like if you took all of your money and you got rid of taxes that it's like, okay, we're not gonna grow our business anywhere. We're just gonna sit on this money and do nothing. You should be investing anyway, right? Service rich countries. Well what they found was that uh, between two and eight percent of GDP would be lost if if the US totally and completely shut down its borders. Now, if you consider that the whole entire world uh, about, you know, I, I did a video on this about 5% of the American GDP. Yes, just America as, as an example. But to speak a little bit more broadly, uh, about 5% about rounding up of the economy in the world, uh, of the global north, I should say, not the world, uh, is based on imports from the global south, about 5%. And so uh, even in the extreme... That? How do you calculate? Well, because we, we have uh, that's what you do trade is, data, right? right? There's there's data on how much uh, imports are from what country. Is he acting like this is incalculable? Is that a word? Calculatable? Incalculable? Incalculatable? Beyond calculation? I mean, is and where they're going to, uh, and obviously we have a classification for global south and north, and so uh, you can you can calculate it uh, with a with fair ease. Uh, obviously, your conceits and stuff, but you know it's it's. It's all out there. But no, no, are we, really are quick. We what I was going to say it's worth by its cost, though, because like the argument that I would make then is that it's undercosted in those areas. That's the reason why we put all the trouble into engaging in neo imperialism. You have these foreign countries where we do rely on this stuff they bring in. And also, just because it's a small portion of our GDP doesn't mean it's unimportant, you know? Maybe 2% of our GDP goes towards lumbering, but you can't cut that out. The economy would die without that. It's not like. 
it's not like 2% off the top, right? It's it's 2% out from a critical industry. It's like the difference between saying that you're, you know, you're removing like the roof tiling from a house or you're removing like a, a, a like, um, you know, like a load bearing pillar. Like how much of a percentage of our GDP goes into like rare earth mineral stuff like lithium, right? But if we didn't have any of that, even if it counted for just one tenth of 1% of our total GDP, we would be fucked. Right, so it's it, it clearly relies on more um, than just that. It's a good counter argument. Not, not necessarily. So we we, to a certain extent, we would be fucked if we didn't have lithium. That's true. But most every good has some sort of applicable substitute. So you're talking about like lithium batteries for for whatever use you might have. Obviously, you can use nickel. You can use cobalt, um, things like that. Um, not now for that's batteries. just a you need you need lithium, right? That's the modern battery well, that we use. No, no, that's that's true, and I, I don't want to get bogged down in an incredibly specific example, but um, it's just a matter of like what they took into account for their analysis is is the substitutability of trade. So the idea would be that, and this is why they give a range, so two to eight percent. Now, uh, if 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 goods are incredibly substitutable, right? If if basically if if the U.S. produced the goods that we get abroad, but domestically, uh, given the amounts that we have domestically. Uh, how, how substitutable are these? If they're incredibly substitutable, gains from trade are actually very low. If they're not very substitutable, gains from trade are very, very high. Because if we can just substitute things out, well, we don't need to trade. If we absolutely cannot substitute things out, we, we absolutely need to trade. Now, the point that I was going to make is that it is true that arguably it's a naive and sort of shallow analysis to just look at trade accounting to answer this question, how reliant is the global north on the global south? But I think that you can also look at the actual specific question. You can look at unequal exchange, right? Which is how much lower are, you know, sort of uh, the importers, basically. You could say the importers, but how much lower are the people in global so South nations being paid relative to their production? Wait, real quick. Why can't I see my mining of the other, that rare shit? Or it seems like it's really shitty, the data on your, like, I have to go, I have to bring up this menu, then I've got to go to this menu, then I've got to scroll down here to see like how much hazelnut I have. That's kind of weird. Am I capped at 1500? How do I increase that storage? It's kind of weird, but okay. Relative to the production of workers in the global north, the difference is unequal exchange. And even that specific number, obviously it's even less because it's specific. It's only three or 4% of GDP. Yeah, that's in the video when you, when you start arguing with your chat about people citing the 3%. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about actually the specific amount that is transferred in wealth in terms of they have this much productivity, but they're paid less for it, you know, for some structure, some other reason or another. It's only about three, four percent of, of GDP, which well, uh, the so last thing I'd say three to four, sure, go on. three to four percent of our GDP is accounted for by the relative gains that we achieve by relying on the lower pay that we can get in those developing countries. Real quick before we go on. Um, Comparative advantage does not necessarily rely on some exploitation. It might be the case that Samantha builds chairs quicker and better than Jonathan does. So if I outsource my chair production to Samantha, I can build IKEA sets way quicker and for way cheaper and at way higher quality than if Jonathan does it. Now, just because I'm getting a comparative advantage, meaning they can produce something more efficiently than I can, doesn't mean I'm exploiting them. It might be that for a variety of reasons, they're just set up to excel in that particular area. Just because you are getting an advantage, fuck, trade is not zero sum. Nothing, very little, very, almost nothing in economics is a zero sum exchange. It is entirely possible to have these mutually beneficial exchanges. Yeah, a comparative advantage might be something as stupid as your location, right? I can't grow. I'm not even gonna give an example because I don't know anything about like what can grow where. But like some plant that I could grow, you know, near the equator, I can't grow in Alaska, right? There might be a greater uh, comparative advantage in growing something in another place. Or when it comes to shipping goods, right? Growing or producing or manufacturing certain goods near really popular trade routes on, you know, on um, on coastal lines near oceans or, or um, into seas or whatever, you know, that might be a comparative advantage. Um, there's all sorts of things that might make it so that trading is preferential with a certain partner that isn't just you're exploiting the weakest and lowest of those workers you're ripping them off you're stealing from them and it, it's not that one dimensional okay that's such a naive way to look at things Ugh. 
Sorry. That's exactly right. Isn't that like one trillion USD though? I mean, you say like 3% of our GDP, like it's a tiny hit that we could weather, yeah. but you're basically describing like the hit that we took from COVID. That on its own, just yeah. that, like the wage differential would be enough to single-handedly like bring about a recession, if not like worse, you know? No, no, you're you're absolutely right. That was the second thing I was going to say um, w w when you jumped in, uh, which was that uh, it's absolutely the case. You know, if you look at Global North GDP uh, over time, what you'll find is that uh, we lost about anywhere from you know three to four percent of GDP as a result of the COVID downturn, a little under three percent of GDP as a result of the previous recession, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. So, the idea of overnight getting rid of literally all unequal exchange Thank you, is. It would cause a recession, but the idea that you espouse and that a lot of socialists espouse, which is that um, uh -oh. it is unsustainably the case that nations in the global north, could they could never reform out of this. It's just not true. Even if they did it tomorrow, you know, flick your hands and all unequal exchange is, is, is gone and there's worker parity across the world, um, you'd, you'd get a bad recession. Uh, but we'd make it out of it. We've had worse recessions before, um, but also that's not what anyone's advocating for. The reality is what most people would advocate for is change over time, over you know, 10, 20, 30 year period, uh, you know, similar to any sort of reformist. And that would of course depress any sort of uh, you know, absolutely destructive effects of, of getting rid of unequal exchange. The, the, the issue that I have with this is twofold. Yeah, take them out, First Bosch. of all, I don't think it's theoretically impossible to do without it. I just don't think capitalist countries will do it. Capitalist countries have a long-standing history of engaging in some pretty nefarious behavior if it maintains the interests of their business consult. I mean, it seems like, it seems like if I were to defer to history, you know, like we're talking about countries that I think the CIA has literally overturned democratically elected leaders. I mean, we've invaded countries. In large part because it you know benefits our business interests because it makes us wealthy because it transfers wealth from their country to ours we'll install leaders who are okay with the economic changes we enforce on their nation the world bank and the imf serve as the neo-colonial arms of regime change where we say they can get the money they need to build up a when lefties bring this up i really 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 want more detail because never 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 has any historical example that I've dug into ever been that simple? Hey, here's a country, democratically elected leader. Um, the country is going well. Everybody's happy. Everybody's doing great shit. And then all of a sudden the CIA comes along and fucks it all up. God damn it. That goddamn CIA. Like, it's always more complicated than that. There's always more um, going on with that. I feel like, yeah, the CIA and the IMF are, um, are, are always like these, it, it's like the... It's like the right wingers version of the FBI and the NSA who are like always domestically spying on, you know, right wing groups and shit. Um, yeah, I, I wish that they would bring up like here's let's go through some concrete examples, because usually it's a little bit more complicated than just saying um, the CIA ruined everything, you know. But OK. A country, but only if they neoliberalize in ways that make them good targets for us. So. I, so it's 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 not about like is it impossible to do this it's about whether or not it's gonna happen with the incentives that we have right now you know um mm -hmm. but uh, but i also want to add to that as well i'm still i'm not sure. convinced by this whole like which percentage of the gdp accounting narrative thing right so most of the gdp here in america doesn't come from manufacturing or imports it comes from the service economy that's like two-thirds of our economy right there so you say that like if we cut out all goods from China, which is about a half trillion dollars a year, you know, if we didn't import anything from them, and that's just China, that it would only account for like 3% of our GDP. Okay, but those are goods we're bringing in. Maybe it accounts for 3% of our total GDP, but how much of it does it account for the GDP related to the actual consumption and use of physical things that we bring in from the rest of the world? If he's so he's hitting on something that's pretty true. Um, and I think this concept, this gets a little bit more complicated. Um, he's probably heard it of a, in a destiny conversation. Ah. So, um, there's a concept called specialization of labor, um, or division of labor. 
And I think sometimes what happens is, is if you engage with a, another country for trade, so if you export part of your supply line to another country, it allows your labor to increasingly specialize, which means um, some group of employees that would have been able to produce some economic gain or whatever can now specialize further and produce even more because you're trading with another country um, in some other thing. Um, I, I believe this is true. I don't know if it's necessarily that simple, but it hits on something I'm pretty sure that's true. Two thirds of our GDP is trapped in the service industry, which is dependent upon the stuff that we import from other countries, that change is magnified significantly, you know? It's like saying, um, you know, it's, it's like saying that if you stop eating like citrus foods, uh, you know, it only decreases the total like vitamins in your body by like 0.5%, but you need those to not get scurvy. It doesn't take it all off across the board. It takes it off in vital ways that have a disproportionate effect on the economic outcome. Sure. So, uh, I guess to respond sort of point by point. So, um, I, I, obviously, I think if you're if if you claim to be speaking more hyperbolically previously, um, I, I do accept the olive branch of of that. It's not theoretically impossible. Um, what I would say is that uh, in terms of capitalist countries, won't do it. You know, they won't reform. Um, I would say that it's not. This is not necessarily. And I know it's a shocking thing for a lot of people. Is that. This is also not necessarily bore out in the numbers. Obviously, people might reference, um, you know, the the fact that social spending as a percentage of GDP across the the Western and sort of global North world has only increased, and it's only increased uh, relatively precipitously over time. The economies of the world are spending more and more on welfare and on things that would increase uh, equality, decrease inequality. And obviously, if we're talking about Nordic countries, that's times a hundred basically. Um, in regard to sort of the the historical analysis of the CIA and the IMF. Um, I, 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 I disagree in part with, you know, the, the CIA has... The IMF is like... The, the IMF is basically like the boogeyman. It's like the international version of the CIA, where the IMF basically goes around to poor countries, tries to loan them money, and then fucks them over because that's what it does. Um, yeah, that, that's that's the... Anytime lefties start bringing up the IMF, you're about to hear some crazy shit every single time, but sort of led particularly to the to the stifling of good socialist government across the world um i would take a more national security view i mean for instance if if the u.s was so incredibly you know diametrically opposed to to communism that they kill every communist movement around um why did we give military and and, and aid in general to the yugoslavian government uh, under tito in 1951 because well, it's because it was he, a national he, security interest. Well, you know, right, I mean. because he was able to push a wedge against the USSR by doing so. But I'm not... Absolutely. There's no national security interest. What you're talking about right now, our national security interest is our business interests. Those are one and the same. Economically being mm. starved out is functionally the same as losing political power. We've enforced regime change in tons of countries across the world, from the Middle East to Southeast Asia to Latin America to Central America. Yeah. Like, these weren't done because these guys are, like, going to bomb our country or whatever. We did it because we wanted leaders in there that were willing to trade with us instead of with the USSR. We're clearly willing to kill to make sure that our businessmen can get the contracts they need. No, no, and I, I, would, I would never take the view that this has never happened, right? I, I in fact, totally agree with the hey, idea DGD, that important business... Question. What would happen if you dumped 100 D-cell batteries into a bathtub full of salt water? I have no idea. Does it discharge at all? Interest, sort of economic interest more broadly, is of a national security importance, uh, you know, to some extent or, or another, right? My only point was that um, the focus is, is more a national security interest and not some sort of fervent hatred uh, for communism abroad. You know, for I instance, never said again, it was if, about fervent you know, hatred for communism. I just think it's about securing business interests. Well, national security interests. I get, I get what you're saying. We might be speaking pack, past each other. I was also going to reference the, 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 the socialist uh, Rajavan government as well as, as a government oh, that shit. the U.S. gets so sorry. Uh, I don't you know, think, helps out a decent amount. I don't think amount, they have but... an ideological opposition to like the building of socialism. I think they have an ideological opposition to things that don't make their companies money. Usually the two overlap, but if they don't, then, you know. Well, I, I think yes and no. Obviously, I'm, I'm not a historian, so I'm not able to provide an incredibly in-depth analysis but again I, I do think over time it is it's proven that generally countries have become more amicable to redistribution and social spending and i do think uh, especially in the present day context i don't 
to me, I don't know if there's a lot of justification for like the CIA is and, and the IMF and the World Bank are still currently serving as quote neo-colonial arms of regime change. But the well, second point you brought up, uh -oh. sure, go on. Uh oh. No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, like when you when you to be fair, maybe there is a modern day example of the CIA like getting like totally getting rid of, of socialist governments today. I, I, I'm not sure, but uh -oh. um, the point is, is that a lot of those instances, again, are more focused on national security, not necessarily, like there's no reason that a socialist country uh, doesn't sort of participate in the markets. I mean, even the Soviet Union did that as well. It's just a matter of national security interests. Well, but, but the IMF well, and the World Bank are, well, I mean, they're Well, they're literally banks, examples so. of the CIA getting involved because socialist governments were nationalizing industries, which meant that they were, um, they could no longer like make, make money off it, you know? Uh oh. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about like that. No, I, I agree. There's examples of that. People talk to fuck? people speak about like the Iran uh, government, in the 1950s that got overthrown, sort of uh, allegedly or supposedly. I'll give it to you the about the nationalizing of the oil industry. It's I get all not that. Allegedly, right? it's I'm happened not, a lot. I mean, like the regime change. No, no I know. You know I, I, no, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying uh, it's not about like ideological opposition to communism. It's just like this definitely has happened a lot. You know. And the IMF no, no, and the I, World Bank, the, sure. these aren't like lefty criticisms. This has happened, like the criticism section for the IMF is pretty specific in detailing that like many countries and organizations think that they're essentially like loan sharks and strongmen whose job it is to incentivize the economic developments that pull money away from welfare programs and away from nationalization and towards, uh, you know, like pro-Western business interest stuff, you know? Wow. Well, um, it... it it depends, right? So again, I, I'm not going to disagree with some of that historical analysis that, yes, the CIA and the U.S. government so more broadly or the Global North even more broadly um, have engaged in nefarious practices that have stifled um, ostensibly communist countries. Obviously, there's you can argue about Vietnam and Soviet Union, whether they're communist or not, whatever. I mean, you get what I'm saying. Um, when it comes to the IMF and the world... Push Bank, back more, Vosh. Um, there's both liberal and socialist uh, and right-wing, frankly, uh, criticisms of those institutions. Um, what they are fundamentally are banks. They're banks charged with getting interest back on the loans that they give. You only need a loan from the IMF or the World Bank. Um, the World Bank less so because they do more development aid, but you only need a loan from the IMF if, you're, if your country is in relatively dire financial straits. Um, and so the idea of the IMF instituting conditional financing so that they can get their money back on their loans um, Again, I don't think it's necessarily a communism or capitalism thing. Capitalist countries have been strapped with IMF debt that they've been unsustainably able to to repay. So yeah, I think that they, the IMF part of the precondition. The, well, I was going to say that for the, the last sentence was that so. the IMF and the World Bank's uh, you know modus operandi is more sort of ideologically neutral no, again, uh, than anything. Again, I'm not saying they're going after socialists. I'm just saying that they're doing whatever they can to make sure that these countries are amicable to Western business interests. They'll do that to capitalist countries too if they need to. They would they would do it to us if they needed to. Um, but th there's a precondition well, when, when for when you say loans. amicable to Western business interests. What do you, what do you mean by that? You know, when I, when I think of like about the policies, getting someone to repay a loan, I mean, bribe, right? You know. But, well, they they well, offer financial assistance on yeah. the condition that you liberalize your economy, which means that you open it up to the kinds of systems that allows the West to take advantage of them. Damn. Um, you, you'd have to give some- Imagine how like evil it is that you're trying to make somebody liberalize their economy by giving them access to Western markets while simultaneously saying a blockade exists in Cuba because they are unable to access Western markets. <laughs> really makes you think. Specifics, in my experience researching the IMF, uh, not the World Bank again, because they do more development aid and I don't, I don't know if anybody's really against development aid, but the IMF specifically, um, a lot of the aid that they extend to nations uh, is is more based on, hey, I'm in almost every country in the world is a member of the IMF. Hey, I'm X nation. Um, I am financially in, a, in an incredible dire spot and the IMF might come in, lend them a bunch of money to refinance their debt. And again, because they're a bank, they want to get their money back. And so part of that might be um, getting rid of like wasteful bureaucratic spending or, you know, uh, cut, get, get balancing the fiscal state, none of which are necessarily good things. And you know, when you're dealing with a recession. But again, if you're taking a loan from the IMF, I mean, yeah. you, you, so you need to pay it back. It from, creates moral hazard if you don't. I'm not talking about paying back the loan. Tell I'm them what you're talking about, about Bosh. The conditions. What are the this conditions? Is the section conditionality of loans. IMF conditionality uh -oh. is a set of policies or conditions the IMF requires in exchange for financial resources. 
The IMF does require collateral from countries for loans, but also requires the government seek assistance to correct its macroeconomic imbalances in the form of policy reform. If the conditions are not met, the funds are withheld. The concept of conditionality was introduced in a 1952 executive board decision, coincidentally right after the Cold War began, and later incorporated into the Articles of Agreement. Stuff like cutting expenditures and raising revenues, also known as austerity, focusing economic output on direct export and resource extraction. That's interesting. See, the way most wealthy countries today are wealthy is that they focused on more advanced education and technological development. But they're encouraging these countries to focus on raw resource extraction, which makes them very easy targets for Western industries and markets to buy up the uh, stuff that they sell for cheap. Wow. The devaluation of currencies, trade liberalization, increasing stability of investment, balancing budgets, removing price controls and state subsidies, privatization or divestiture of all or part of state-owned industries, enhancing the rights of foreign investors, improving governance and fighting corruption. Now, some of these are good, like balancing budgets. I mean, fine, but this is very clearly about making these countries like useful to the West with regards to trade relations. Wow. Right. And I, I think the issue with, with reading that off is that it presumes that those are actual requirements in every instance of lending. It just depends on the country, right? So for instance, if you're like Chile, for instance, and Chile, this is not the case currently, but say that you're Chile, right? And you're in dire financial straits. Obviously, the IMF is going to recommend that you expand your production of copper because that's a natural resource that you have. And of course, it would make sense if you need money to pay off debt, that you would expand your capacity to mine copper, right? Do you think it's like Obviously a coincidence they... that all of these things are beneficial to like the West when it comes to trading with them? Maybe it's the thing that liberalization of trade and a lot of these things, I think somebody linked earlier, a lot of these things are considered like um, uh, like the Washington consensus of ways to like expand an economy or whatever. Um, I, but it might be the, the fact that maybe like a lot of these things are just good things to do um, for your economy. like. I don't like even countries that weren't forced to take loans or whatever that eventually started to expand their economies like did so via liberalization of their economy. Uh, it happened after the USSR collapse. You know, Russia did it. It happened in Vietnam, which people love to cite so much. It happened in China, where the uh, increasing liberalization of the economy, increasing allowance of foreign direct investment, like all of these things are things that people generally consider as being beneficial to your economy, right? Like, <laughs> like what about the what about well, the no. four tigers of, of of Asia? You know, like Singapore and stuff. A lot of those countries became very wealthy, not by focusing on mining a bunch of oil and selling it off to the West, but actually by engaging in a fuck ton of nationalist, um, uh, like local, like pricing control and a lot of, um, fuck, what is it called? When you're, um, when, when you like prioritize local industry? Protectionism. Um, like protectionism? Yeah, protectionism, yeah. yeah. These countries that actually managed to claw their way out of poverty engaged in protectionism, built up their own industries and rejoined the world economies when they had something unique to offer. We know that strategy works, but the IMF is advocating for the opposite. Liberalization, de-investiture, de-nationalization, focus on just mining more gold, more lithium, more oil. That might be good for stabilizing the budget immediately, but this is so very clearly like just a, a way of making these countries profitable for Western business investment. Why else would making yeah. enhancing the rights of foreign investors be one of the things they focus on? Well, because one of the ways that you can build wealth in your country is to encourage foreign investment. Right? So, for instance, if we look at the example of Botswana, which a lot of people sort of hold up as an example of African uh, development, it's one of the most developed countries in Africa. Uh, what the leaders of Botswana did after uh, the current party in power actually first took power, which I think was in like the 1950s or something like that, um, what they did was engage in a lot of foreign investment and public-private partnerships to develop their natural resources and retain a large part of that wealth. And as a response to that pirate investment and good governance and sort of anti-corruption policies of the early governments, uh, Botswana is the most, uh, arguably the most developed country in Africa. I mean, you mentioned the four Asian tigers. Um, a, a, a significant part of all of those countries' economies is looking outward trade. Now, if you want to make, if you want to have an argument about the uh, domestic uh, sort of production capacity and protectionism, if, if you're more in favor of protectionism or something like that, that's not an unreasonable argument. Destiny, to be fair, there is a phenomenon where resource-rich places have a hard time growing. Yeah, there's a name of this. It's Is it like the resource curse or the curse of oil or... Uh, there's, a, there's like a name for this. 
It might just be called the resource curse. But yeah, a lot of countries that are rich in natural resources have. But I think that some people are critical of this because it's not very explanatory. It just There just happens to be a lot of countries like rich in natural resources that are also fucked um, for other reasons. And also, I believe there are countries that are rich in natural resources that people don't think are. Like the U.S. has a lot of natural resources and shit. Um, and I'm pretty sure there are a lot of, like Norway has a lot of natural like oil and shit. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of first world countries with, I shouldn't say first world in a sense, but a lot of like super developed countries that have a lot of natural resources as well. We just don't think of that as much, but I don't know. But. Argument uh, to be had. It's not like totally unreasonable. Um, it's just that when the IMF recommends policy changes, they're not recommending it with the idea of we want to prop up the global neo-colonial business interest. It's we are a bank lending money, and these are the conditions by which your country, at least historically is the case, are able to build wealth depending on the country uh, and will be able thusly to pay back uh, your debt and finance yourself more sustainably. This is, but no, I'm sorry. This is Ooh. either dishonest Ooh. or delusional. Ooh. The IMF and the World Bank. He hit him with the double D. Ho, 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 ho. Are clearly economically partisan organizations. They have been widely criticized for not actually engaging in the kind of policy prescriptions that make countries better. In fact, the universality of their conditions is one of the things they often get criticized for. They don't take into consideration what's good for that country. Instead, they just apply a blanket set of pro-Western business interests. I'm not opposed to trade, but Botswana is an interesting case for you to cite because their economy is all diamonds. What do you think is going to happen when the world demand for diamonds falls off? That country is going to burn. Botswana's entire economy is dependent on making sure that global diamond uh, uh, trade and demand is high. The United States is not. South Korea is not. Countries with strong, robust economies don't rely on the export of a single rare material. We saw this happen in Venezuela. Whenever you focus your economy on the export of a single commodity, if prices crash, that's it. All your people starve. Botswana has Just to be clear, that is not why Venezuela's economy crashed. Venezuela has a whole bunch of problems endemic to itself related to corruption, inability to run their, um, inability to run their, like, fucking refineries and shit. Venezuela has lots of problems. It was not the collapse of oil that caused Venezuela to have so much issues, so many issues. Built itself a strong economy. It's just riding a bubble for as long as it has diamonds and diamonds sell well. But that's not the same thing. Like, 10 years from now, you realize Botswana might end up being the next Venezuela, right? Like, the next thing people look at and go, oh, well, they should have diversified. Well, no, not necessarily. So the answer is theoretically yes. I'm, I'm certainly not being dishonest when talking to you, and I'm not defending the IMF necessarily. I think I have my own criticisms for the IMF as well. In the, in the video that I made about the IMF, uh, one of the final points that I made was that Indeed, you can hate the IMF and not like what they do. It's just that you should do it for the right reasons, right? Conditional financing is bad, not because it stifles socialist government uh, abroad, but because when socialist governments get in financial trouble and they go into a recession, they don't necessarily need to cut spending further. Everyone agrees that austerity is bad, but IMF is not concerned with, well, if I can finish, the IMF isn't necessarily concerned with sustain, uh, how do I put it? Um, getting these countries out of recession, they're concerned with the countries being able to sustainably finance themselves and getting their money back on their loans. They're a bank. They care about, they care about making these countries ripe for liberal investment. That's why all of their conditions are amicable to that. Otherwise, they would not focus on some of the stuff that they focus on here. I mean, wow. it's, it's, it's so clear. Big like, claim. We get, Thrown down. Adjustment policies usually include, so we talked about privatization and divestiture, you know, um, and uh, uh, um, making things easier for, for foreign governments. Reducing government expenditure and government employment. In what world is reducing government expenditure on developing infrastructure not damaging to these? Hey, Destiny. Econo Boy, the guy who watched this debating, it's time to have a chat with you now or after you finish reacting to this video if you have time. Um... If he wants to, I, I don't like to talk to people just because I listen to a video. If we have something to talk about, sure, but maybe, yeah. These countries, every successful country in the world today spends a lot of government money on building out infrastructure, on securing basic provisions for existence, but they encourage you not do that because they don't care if these people have an educated population. They care if they have a population that's hung, that's well-fed enough to work in the oil rigs or the diamond mines 
that they can then sell off to Western businesses. Botswana is wealthy because De Beers and those other diamond companies in the West uh, 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 buy up the products that they sell. This is a favorable enterprise to us and an unfavorable one to them because we're denying them the ability to, re to develop a truly autonomous economic situation. Like we're, we're just well, relying no, on I, raw resource extraction. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. The goal of most any economy, especially smaller nations that might not have as much uh, sort of diversified resource wealth, mm -hmm. isn't necessarily to be autonomous, right? Because again, you said you're in favor of trade. Of course, you'd understand that uh, tr you know trade requires specialization to a certain extent, and with specialization and sort of engaging in international oh. trade. Um, you can build wealth that way. That's what Botswana has done. Specialization um, of for labor. instance, when we look at you could look at Norway as another example where they've really leaned in to their oil wealth, right? Now, what they've done is taken a lot of that wealth and put it in a social wealth fund, diversify that wealth fund, and then put that money right back into the economy uh, in the is, form of is, you know this is not many comparable. different investments. It's, it's not diamond comparable. prices yeah, go shut down, down. Botswana crashes. If oil prices go down, which they have, Stop Norway has a diversified mouth. economy that can survive because Norway is in the... I wonder what, what... Okay. How do you even... Botswana? I don't know. How to... Botswana Wikipedia. No. Economy. Damn. They are pretty heavy on diamond exports. This country has earned the highest sovereign credit rating in Africa and has stockpiled foreign exchange reserves over $7 billion in 2005 and 2006, amounting to over almost two and a half years of current imports. This is a pretty dated article, if it's going back that far, or just the source is old. No petroleum reserves identified. Sucks. Significant quantities of uranium discovered in 2007. Jeez. Okay. Graph on the right says 2016. Yeah, I see this. Okay. So the diamond exports seem to be, or at least some, it's pretty important. I wonder what Norway, what percentage of Norway's exports is. Nope, don't care about that. You're not going to show me a pretty export graph, are you? Oh, jeez. Damn. <laughs> Fish filet? Holy shit, Kanye West fans. Okay, Jesus. Imperial core, where we apply economic policies that make sure we survive, that prioritize our growth and our development, whereas Botswana is in the imperial periphery, which exists only insofar as it is useful to our businesses, and we couldn't give a damn about them otherwise. Couldn't give a damn about exactly them. It's exactly the same thing that China's doing, but they're better at it. The Belt and Road Initiative at least involves a degree of infrastructural investment. That means these countries aren't going to crash the next time oil or diamond or lithium prices fluctuate based Now, I'm not saying these examples don't exist, but something that would super help Vosh's argument here is if Vosh should give an example of like, remember when this country got an IMF loan and then afterwards, in an attempt to pay it back, their economy was like completely hijacked and fucked by foreign investors thanks to the IMF loan or whatever. Like that would be a really good, like one, two, boom, boom to hammer home Vosh's point if that existed. So like we could probably Google even um, countries, I don't want to help them with these arguments, but countries fucked, I shouldn't say that. Um, countries, negative outcome, IMF loan. I wonder if we could, we, I'm sure this must exist. Mm, the effect of IMF. When a country failures on an IMF loan, foreign capital usually flees that country. Uh, 
Destiny, see here. What is this? Somebody linked me. Debt, the first 5,000 years. A brilliant, deeply original. Did you really just link me a 540 page book? Thank you, the real Chris Rock. You're just, you're a genius, my dude. Doesn't China go about its own completely differently? They're specifically trying to industrialize a nation rather than satisfy. Well, I think they're just trying to get like geopolitical um, gains by controlling like, can I say seafaring ports? Are all ports seafaring? In the next recession. We have to be like, this is, this is a, an incredibly inequitable exchange. In the earlier in this convo, you talked about how the US could like shrug off no longer trading with China, which I disagree with, but at least we do have a diversified economy. Well, they don't say have that, to that. Be fair. Okay, but they don't have that luxury. These other countries, now South Korea does, Singapore does, they could do that because they have diversified economies, but Botswana could not. They I mean, it's probably gonna take a while, totally. right? Like, Which means that we can do anything we want to them because they have no well, recourse. Uh, wait, what? Do anything again, we want? What does he mean by that? Well, to be fair, again, I, I don't think Botswana is absolutely singularly a diamond economy of course they're diversified to a certain it's 62 percent of their of their exports is is diamonds and the majority of their gdp comes from the wealth they gain from exports a lot of other stuff that they sell like up to 80 percent in total alongside the diamonds is stuff like nickel it's uh other oh, I didn't want earth to... minerals and metals they mine up harvest this yet God damn it. yeah yeah no i i'm not I certainly wouldn't take the position that uh diamonds are not a significant part of, of the Botswana economy. It's only it's only the idea that uh, the argument that you're making oh is God. more or less, uh, how do I put it? Um, like, essentially, the argument that you seem to be making is that uh, Botswana's economy is bad, and though they have built a lot of wealth from their diamond mines, um, it is not necessarily the most sustainable because at some point, maybe diamonds become worthless, and all of a sudden, a third of their economy just gets wiped off the map, because they've not diversified. Um, now, to a certain extent, that's true, but that's why I bring up the idea of uh, like Norway, where they have taken advantage of their resource wealth very much so, and they've diversified it, arguably in a more responsible way than what Botswana has done. Right now, we can make sort of these arguments about uh, you know Botswana's economy is not as diversified, Norway's economy, maybe the social wealth fund's good or bad, whatever. The whole point that I'm trying to get at is that um, the IMF, you know flaws and all, good or bad, whatever, um, is not necessarily an institution that's based... Uh, Here's a question, I guess. I don't know how Vosh would respond. I could probably guess. If the IMF loans are so horrible and predatory, why are those monsters fighting each other? Why do countries ever take IMF loans? Aren't they better off just risking it alone or going it alone? Like, are you saying that we shouldn't have IMF loans available? But Vosh would probably say, well, they're probably doing it as a last recourse because they don't want their people to starve or something, maybe. That would be my guess. Sort of singularly on... Uh, stifling good socialist governments abroad. You I mean, keep, for instance, Ecuador took it. Well, what I was going to say, hold on, hold on. What I, for instance, what I was going to say was that uh, Ecuador recently took uh, a, a financing agreement with the IMF, and it's not like Ecuador had to get rid of their national oil company, right? So it's a lot of examples and nuance in, in all of this I'm analysis that, that, that I think we miss. They always do all of their preconditions, but they're always trying to make these countries more amicable to Western business investment. And I, I have never said it's about taking down socialist countries. I'm only saying that they're trying to make these countries easier to invest in. They'll do that to they'll do that to fuel well, countries if they need to. It's you, not. You, you did you did say that the IMF was an arm of neo-colonial regime change. Which yes, I, that is I objectively you... the case. Objectively, but they'll do that to okay, anyone who's not favorable to sure. Western business interests. No, no, that it. No, this is what like. How can I trust your opinion on whether or not Norway or other social democracies engage in neo-colonialism when, when you're, you're bad faith? To admit that the IMF and the World Bank do exactly that, like. It'd be like me trying no, to talk I, to somebody I've already... about like sexual sure. assault, and then they're like, D "Dude, it's not like rapey if like you know she's drunk." Like, I, like your your your, <laughs> your way okay, of perceiving. Well. Oh your man, perceiving Watch is about, is about to break the, out the, the coconuts on this dude. To look at here is totally different from mine. Like I think like we have very different preconceptions when it comes to stuff like this, right? Well, sure, but I, it, it's important to recognize those preconceptions, and, and I'm recognizing without a doubt that the IMF is, is not perfect. There's a lot of criticisms for the IMF to be had. Arguably, it shouldn't exist as an institution. Um, really? And that they've done um, arguably more bad than good, some Damn. good, maybe not more than bad. So I'm, I'm making all those concessions uh, in my analysis. Um, I'm, I'm really just, I'm really what I'm arguing against is the idea that 
the IMF is is focused on regime change, um, incredible neocolonialism, when really the way that I view it is um, the IMF is a bank similar to how, like you mentioned, the Belt and Road Initiative for China. Um, something that they're concerned with, of course, is their lending arrangements that include being paid back. This is why they get in all that trouble with, uh, you hear about the Sri Lankan case with the Chinese lending because uh, Sri Lanka wasn't able to pay back Chinese loans. And that's why China gets a lot of the same criticism the IMF does, because Right now, China is trying to get money from Sri Lanka, even though it's a heavily indebted nation. I mean, that's the main point. It's a good faith um, argument. I'm not trying to be dishonest. No, I know. It's just, can I, can I read this blurb from the Wikipedia? <laughs> from the 1950s uh, sure. outward, the United States doled out loans to third world nations, now referred to as least developed countries. The U.S. encouraged neoclassical and free market economics and LDCs for two reasons. One, countering the spread of socialist ideology during the Cold War, and two, as a means of accumulating wealth by means of foreign direct investment as well as interest on the loans. The immediate and stated and clear goals from the beginning of this organization with regards to the structural adjustment policies we've talked about were explicitly about maintaining ideological hegemony and by accumulating wealth. Nothing here, their, their stated goals were not helping the third world. When the fuck have we ever cared about helping the third world? When the fuck? When when is the West ever given a single shit about the oh development God, of those true. countries? Keep we cussing. God, you're so strong right now. We don't care about, their no. development. We don't care about those people. Beneficial to our economy. Okay, I don't understand this point of Vosh's argument. I think it's because he saw a good article on the wiki and he wanted to read it. So Vosh, I think, has maintained thus far a pretty reasonable position. And he said over and over again, and this guy's the kind of boy is missing it. Vosh has said, I'm not saying that the IMF is attacking socialist countries, just anybody that we can profit from. And he, and he did repeat that several times. The convoy keeps trying to say, you're trying to say it's an arm of, uh, you know, capitalist countries. And Vosh's like, no, I'm not saying that. But now that Vosh found like the killer paragraph, um, now Vosh is like, well, look, in the beginning, they did say they were going after socialist countries. Why would Vosh walk back to that and then validate all of the Econo boys like prior claims, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. It seems weird. In particular, Western companies sought to gain access to raw commodities, especially minerals oh, and agricultural wait, 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 products. Quickly, where are you reading from? Wikipedia. History, uh, wiki, structural adjustment, hashtag criticisms. This is under the IMF article. Okay, gotcha. Go on. Yeah. In particular, Western companies sought to gain access to raw commodities, especially minerals and agricultural products, often in exchange for capital or large-scale infrastructural projects. After the run on the dollar of the 1980s, uh, the United States adjusted its monetary policy and instituted other measures so it could begin competing aggressively for capital on a global scale. This was successful, as it can be seen from the current account of the country's balance of payments. Enormous capital flows to the United States had the corollary of dramatically depleting what? the availability of capital to poor and middling countries. Giovanni Arihi has observed this scarcity of capital, which was heralded by the Mexican default of 1982. Quote, created a pro pro propitious environment for the counter-revolution of developmental thought and practice that the neoliberal Washington consensus began advocating at about the same time. Taking advantage of the financial straits of many low- and middle-income countries, the agencies of the consensus... <laughs> Dude, I feel like people accuse me of doing this, which is like... Now, to be clear, I just want to be ultra-clear, okay? Nothing is wrong with research on Wikipedia. I do a lot of my research on Wikipedia. Um, sometimes it's a place I start, sometimes it's a place I start and end, okay? Completely, totally, unironically. Um, but this is just, it's a little funny. You gotta admit, okay, this is kind of funny. ...hoisted them measures of structural adjustment that did nothing to improve their position in the global hierarchy of wealth, but greatly facilitated the redirection of capital flows towards sustaining the revival of U.S. wealth and power. But like, I, I don't think I'm giving like a crazy lefty take here or anything. Like, this is the, st this, this is what the org does. We don't care about the developing world. We care about them only insofar as we invest in them. Savage. Right. Well, sh sure. I, I guess again, I, I think we're we're going to have to agree to disagree to a certain extent. I I don't think that there have certainly been a lot of development programs that the U.S. and the Global North broadly have contributed to in terms of trying to build out, uh, you know, either the resource wealth or just the institutions of other nations. Right. Why would we help um, them? You can for call their it. Sake? Well, I'm, I mean, why do we care? What, what do you mean? We. Well, it's sort, of, it's sort of like saying, why why do we have welfare programs, right? I mean, to a certain extent, to we keep, do want to provide aid to Sir, keep our population from revolting. Why would we help? Oh, them? my God. Please don't be this cringe. Why do we have Social Security? In order to pacify the elderly who could otherwise lead the revolutionary charge. Like, fuck off, dude. Come on. 
We even did the Marshall Plan just to keep communist ideology from spreading in Europe. Like, everything we do has a well, price tag attached to it. Oh Why would God. we do something for other countries just, like, to help them out? The whole world is this nihilistic well, I mean, pit of again, selfish I, you, evil. You can ultimately reduce every single thing down to, like, sort of an... Uh, amoral type uh egoist sort of oh we, we always do everything ultimately to help ourselves i mean maybe that's right i'm not really sure but the point is is that that's true for every other country too i mean when you talk about china the reason they engaged in the belt and road initiative in the first place was because they want to develop export markets for themselves so that they can diversify away from the global north broadly yes. because they don't right because yeah, they don't want to be reliant thing. and they're also a capitalist country that uh you know invests in the third world so they could steal money from them yeah damn all right but it, it i guess it gets confusing when you said that china just does it better than us like i guess oh sorry they're well, more effective than us because they aren't limited by the um by the democratic process they're much more aggressive in their yeah, investment yeah, whereas yeah, any yeah, investment yeah, the u.s yeah. did it has to be done yeah. through subsidiaries like the imf or world bank because u.s citizens would never consent to having money spent on investments in developing countries because we hate them. If America hey, just FYI, we like we literally do have like charity shit that goes towards developing countries. Like I'm pretty sure under Bush there was like these unprecedented pushes for things like HIV prevention, for things like anti-malarial drugs. Like we do do a lot of investment into these countries for sometimes no gain. I don't know what we get out of that, right? We've got programs in um, in the federal budget to incentivize the creation of like drugs for rare diseases and shit. Like we absolutely do stuff like this that we don't get anything from. There is a reason why Africa his favorite U.S. president is George W. Bush. Believe it or not, that is that is that is not a meme. Um, like, yeah, we, there, there's like a ton of foreign aid and shit. That I, that's just it's it's. I understand we want to be like super edgy socialists about everything, but damn, chill. Americans well, the, are smart yeah, and sure. self-interested. We would be okay with a few percentage points of our GDP more going to developing uh, uh, nations because we could invest in them and fuck their economies to oh our benefit. Oh my God! But Americans are so stupid and so despicably hateful towards the rest of the world that they can't even understand the basic principles of neo. Is this like, is this uniquely American? Or damn, do you think every other country is this bastion of caring about the uh, caring about uh, like? Uh, Jesus, Tr I hate to say this. Fuck, I don't want to turn into fucking Molina, okay? But like, go travel more, dog. <laughs> there are tons of hateful people in all sorts of other countries. All right, P like there are there are racists in Europe against groups of people that Americans don't even know you could be racist against, right? Like, how the fuck are you racist against a Serbian? What the fuck is that, right? How are you racist against like what's an Eastern European like are, like witches? Like Americans don't even know how many different groups of people you can be racist or hateful against, okay? Jesus Christ. Like, we'll talk about, like, not intervening in, like, African countries. Meanwhile, in Southern and Southeastern Europe, you've got, like, fucking Yugoslavia. You've got, like, Bosnia. You've got, like, fallout from the Ottoman Empire, the Armenian Genocide. There's, like, all sorts of... You've got fucking people in Ireland blowing each other up and shit for up until, what, 96? Or not, what was the Good Friday Agreement? Like, Jesus Christ, okay? This idea that, like, Americans are, like, these uniquely horrible, evil people. Meanwhile, everyone else in the world is, like, hugging each other and, like, holding it. Like, dog, there's a lot of fucked up crazy shit that goes on everywhere. Chill. Holy shit. Ugh, whatever. Jesus. Colonialism. The greatest example of this is probably the American Relief Administration. In 1920 to 21, the Soviet Union was having its first famine, so the U.S. authorized a relief mission that literally was feeding 11 million people a day, vaccinated millions, cultivated land all within the USSR. This isn't really focused on anymore, but we literally fed the country shortly after it was formed and was experiencing massive strife. The party literally thanked <laughs> Hoover, who led the mission. Oh, cute. The low of darkness my old friend Nathan feels. Vosh is dogmatically anti-Washington consensus. Here's a competing worldview. It turns out there's many paths to development. Um, I'm sure there are other ways to do it. Like, I've heard claims that, like, Japan being a highly protectionist economy post-World War II supposedly helped them grow a lot of industry, but I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to be, like... I'm not going to say I'm comfortable enough to tell you this is the way to go to make your country better, but... But it seems like liberalization of your economy generally leads to a lot of positive things. It just seems to be the case. But. We would rather have our money spent on the military than towards the actual mechanisms that actually lead to the control of the world. 
China is not a democracy, so their leaders are free to use their money to invest in other countries and exploit them in the ways that we can only do through the IMF and World Bank. Wow, based. Well, sure, I think, uh, again, to be fair, I think one of, the, one of the things that actually I think happened under the Trump administration was a, a, a international infrastructure development bank, which was U.S. controlled, not just the IMF and the World Bank. Obviously, you could have the same criticisms for those institutions. Um, I think overall, you know, we, 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 again, we're going to have to agree to, to disagree on the IMF necessarily. I think my final point on the IMF would just be that um, I view the IMF more as a bank rather than a, a force of regime change. Um, I think that a lot of the negatives of the IMF are better explained by that mindset than, than, than your mindset. Um, and I think the criticism is, is more palpable uh, with, with my mindset than yours. Um, but would you mind if I move on? We, that was actually your first point. There's, there's a yeah, second point Yeah, we got you made kind of I, on a tangent there. Yeah. Wait, did yeah, I just fuck up? You're good. Because I don't have too, I don't Why have is too this much time. Pointer I, we, still we here. Kind of, we'll be more productive in the next one, yeah? Get me out. Sure, no worries. Sure. Um, so you said your second point was you're not convinced by GDP accounting um, in general. Um, and it, it seemed that you, you, you gave the example of... Um, Oh, you know, if if you stop taking, you know, vitamin A, that's only like five percent of your vitamin intake. But you you really need vitamin A in your in your in your body, right? Or you'll die without it, or you know, something bad will happen. Not a doctor. Um, and uh, you you use that as an example of like, well, how much of our GDP is based on rare earth elements? Uh, and if we stopped getting those or lithium, the economy would be structurally, you know, very very unsound because we need those. So. Um, and you also mentioned that the U.S. economy is mostly services, and services require physical goods, which are, which are very necessary. So, what can lot, I take so, here? Things to say on these points, and I think the point I'm going to make is is applicable to all your points. So, um, so it, it is true, obviously, that um, you need sort of these primary inputs uh, for a lot of the production of the economy. You know, you need iron for steel, you need steel for building, and you need buildings to you know house all those white collar workers or whatever uh, for the services they provide. That's all true, um, but I think that number one, you're assuming again that what I'm advocating for or what the, the sort of world I see is a more sort of autarky style world where people are more closed off. Really what I'm advocating for is the opposite, to become even more open and globalized. And uh, what I would say is that unequal exchange, which is just the idea that workers in the global south would be raised to a living standard, um, at least equitable to their productive uh, capacity, um, wouldn't necessarily shut off trade. It wouldn't mean that we wouldn't have access to those resources. Um, Why would but we what do I that, would though? say, so, uh, so I think the first point that I made. Why was, would we do that when we hate everyone and we're racist? Was the idea that uh, investors uh, across time uh, have become a lot more sort of uh, socially conscious. There's, it's called ESG investing. I'm sure you're aware. Um, environmental, social, and, and government style. Uh, investing and just the idea would be that across time it seems that shareholders and investors are becoming more and more socially conscious uh, and more and more uh, aware of the impacts that they have that trickle out uh, outside the the realm of just their corporate doors and their profit margins. How and, are they changing? Uh, well, so for instance, the phenomenon of ESG investing has become a big thing. For instance, Chase just released uh, a a guideline for their portfolio of lending, which showed that. Um, they actually have uh, actual uh, renewable energy mandates in their portfolio that, well, not renewable, but like carbon uh, sequestration or, you know, carbon reduction uh, mandates in their portfolio, which is to say that Chase said, you know, if you don't reduce your carbon footprint by this amount in a weighted average sense of, of who we lend to, um, we will not lend to you anymore. You'll have a great restriction in how much we lend to you. That's Chase Bank. Is it right? a meaningful restriction? Um, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, I, I want to say, so they, they delineate the their, their emissions into, quote, scope one, two, and three. Um, I I couldn't, I think scope three is like methane, scope one is like carbon. I don't know what scope two is. Um, and the cuts are, uh, essentially the goal would be net zero 2050, which is kind of what the, you know, what the, what the climate industry has, what the, not climate industry, it sounds conspiracy world, but that's essentially what scientists have said is sort of the deadline to become net zero. And so you see a lot of banks and a lot of corporations taking on net zero pledges, even though it's probably more profitable not to do it. Well, and I've so been, oh, I've been seeing, yeah, sure. I've been seeing companies take net zero pledges for a long time now. And I've been seeing very few net zero companies. Wait, who's been taking net zero pledges for a long time? This is all relatively recent. Like I'd say like last five to 10 years, but okay. It seems to me like this is just another way for um, companies and investors to 
you know, spritz up to, to sort of hand wave, what would you call, whitewash the harm they do, you know? Like when GM had that green logo. I mean, I, I want to know, like, is this pledge even legally binding? Or is this just some big virtue signal they're trying to throw out there to lessen the extent of Washington sure. regulations on climate change? Because they were hoping to convince Washington and voters that conscientious companies are doing enough. I mean, because like that's historically, that's always how it's been, right? Every time companies actually have to take a profit hit in order to make the world a better place, they have to be regulated into doing it. They never voluntarily do it. They lie about voluntarily doing it, or they'll try to trick the public. The we clean coal, you remember that? I mean, Christ, we've seen this for decades. It's good marketing, but it doesn't change anything. I would need to see real actionable change being done here. How, how Microsoft has been carbon neutral since 2012, Google since 2007. Is that true? That's pretty crazy. Okay. There are companies that do this. Gotcha. How long of a deadline do we have? Like how long before I see Chase actually stop loaning out to a company because they're not meeting those goals? Why can't I Eventually, dig here? Is this glitched? Sure. So uh, I've got the pledge right here. Um, in terms of the oil and gas, they'd have to reduce uh, emissions by 35% by 2030, for instance. So I think that's a, it's a fairly sizable reduction in carbon emissions, at least in the next nine years. Am I supposed to no, suck I understand, them off but you, the you... next nine years because they said they do no, no, no. <laughs> I've said, Look, I fucked well, girls with well, virginity pledges, all saying... right? I'm just saying. I don't, people are, people are <laughs> well, shiftless, yeah, we've... you know? It's... Yes. Uh, we, we've, uh, we, we've all heard of and or seen uh, the promise ring laid on uh, the nightstand, uh, metaphorically, we could say. So what, what I was going to say is that, uh, of course, it's the case that um, uh, you said, is are these like legally binding? Of course, Chase is, doesn't it's it's a corporation obviously so there's no like law or anything like that it's just a commitment to say that if you don't reduce your your emissions by this date um we will stop lending to you which i think is is a, a fairly reasonable mandate of course you you asked the question um or you 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 posed the maybe the thought that uh well we we don't see a lot of carbon neutral companies today well again the, these are pledges in the future to align oh, with this guy would have known about the google is and uh, climate Microsoft change and, shit. it would have been and, and a pretty warming. good point so of course for if the goal is in 2050 it, well, there are things well, they could do uh, right now to lower their emissions if they wanted to take a cut to their profits. Why is it always in the future? If they really cared, wouldn't they do it like right now rather than well, deferring it to some point in the future? You can't just again. Companies fuck your are company. taking those pledges. I talked about the boom pledges, of ESG investing. What about the well, actual I, no. the, the changes? Though? Well, when I when I say when I say taking those pledges, what I, I should have said is enacting those pledges to a certain extent. I, I talk about the boom of ESG investing uh, that's coming online right now and so com companies are currently making uh strides right now to try and reduce their emissions and and try and enact that which is just to say that it, it is an example of uh companies uh not organically to be fair people want this investors want this uh to uh, to be more green despite it potentially hitting their profit margins and i've already again in the first part of this conversation i mentioned examples of uh countries that have taken steps to limit uh, their supply chain, including things like slave labor or child labor, uh, despite the fact that it might uh, hurt businesses. Uh, so if, if we're moving that to a more happen, sort yeah. of, yeah, if we're moving to a more sort of practical argument, I think that practically it, it, it would be possible and it's been seen and it's it's currently being but, but, seen what, right now. Can you name like a major company that's taken a hit, that, that whose shareholders have taken oh, a fuck, hit? fuck, he doesn't know. Because with no regulation pressuring them to, they've... Why weren't you in this guy's chat earlier, Eric? Carbon emissions? Dumb fuck. So you're asking, if I understand the question, you are asking, name a, comp name a company that is currently net zero or has significantly reduced their sort of contribution no, I, to human suffering. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like they have really like cut back on this or like any other big social economy. Oh my God, if he knew this, if he knew the answer here, Vosh would rage quit the debate. Company, you know, because if they're doing it um, only in ways that don't hurt the net worth of their company, I don't care about that. If they if their investors Wait, why? can look at the numbers and find out that it's not a hurt to them to make these changes, that's great and all, but that doesn't solve the problem. Well, because but it's it still will good, be a no? Hurt to these companies to stop relying on unequal exploitation of the developing world, guaranteed. Well, how did we go for so a I need circle to see on that? Willing Jesus. to take that hit, you know? Sure, sure. So I, it's it's a question that I'm not sure is possible to ask or, or to, to answer. So the, and the reason I would say that is because. Um, obviously, if, if investors want them to do these things and they do these things, well, there's no necessary reason why stock values would, would take a big hit because that's what shareholders are asking for. They're going to keep their stock, right? Now, um, their profit so would I'm, be lower. Pro well, sure, but I'm saying profit. That the, oh, no, Vosh. Profit. 
isn't inexorably tied to your stock value, right? If we, if we would have learned anything from the whole GME craze, it's that your stock value doesn't necessarily have to correlate to, your, to the profits of a company at all, right? A stock only goes for what somebody thinks it's worth. That's it. Now, profit could inform that decision, but like, look at fucking Tesla, okay? Like, it, it doesn't have, there's, it's not like a one-to-one -one thing here or an anything to anything here. Nobody sells their stock even if profits go lower, you don't end up with a lower stock value because obviously stock value is just based on supply and demand of stock. So yes. it's, 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 unfortunately it's a question that it's difficult to engage in, but, um, but I would love it. I think a question that I would pose is, um, you know, what, what is generally your point, right? What is your point regarding, um, getting rid of unequal exchange? Would, would the idea just be that companies won't allow it and the lobby governments to prevent it from happening or, or what does yeah. that broader point look like? Yeah, that's been happening for decades. What, why, why would they ever want? Why? Right, why what's been happening on for a decades? point regarding um, getting rid of unequal exchange? Would, would the idea just be that companies won't allow it and the lobby governments You're to prevent it from happening, or, or what does yeah. that broader point look like? Sixty-six months. Yeah, that's months. been happening Let's for go. decades. Street, why, why, why would they ever want? Twitch. Why would? Why would? Why would investors in the West ever want changes to happen that would make them less money? I've, my entire because life. this is a totally a thing, dude. If you step outside and go anywhere, you don't even have to go like outside and touch grass. You can go touch a Chipotle. Companies all the time get like, there's like a social credit to saying like, oh, like all of our stuff is organically sourced or oh, like all of these things come from blah, 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 right? You pay a premium for that. You pay more money for that, but it sells. Like investors would push for it because like consumers want it. Like there is a, there is a drive in the economy right now for like this more socially conscientious bullshit. And I bet there's investors that do it too. I I guarantee fucking to you that some dude goes into their fucking bank and they're like, I want to invest my money, but I want to make sure it's a socially conscious investment. And they probably like have like investments that they guide people towards as like a percentage of the portfolio that accomplish that. I guarantee you it happens. And for the life of my father and his father before him and going back a while, all they've ever done is do things that make them money. That's all they can do. There aren't really historical examples of people going against this trend. Sometimes the people in a country in a democracy, fight and they fight and they fight and they get regulations put through, you know? But every time the industries fight against it, when pe when when the there were no regulations on like diesel or gasoline that choked the air of New York City back in 1927, it was not the goodwill of companies that led them to regulate like the, the manufacturing of gas. People protested and Washington forced those regulations. When it came to cigarettes and the carcinogens within them, they lied for decades about it. When climate change was known back in the 1960s, the oil and gas companies lied about it for decades by having unfalsifiable evidence that it was the case. I, you, you will, your, your idea is that we can somehow overwrite this near ubiquitous trend of economic interests playing out with no concern to externalities which is in this case the the third world you know wow uh, uh, uh sure. without like hurting its bottom line but that just never happens they always 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 promote their interests above everyone else's well sure so i i, I may have misunderstood the addition, the initial question so when you asked um why would they uh sort of get rid of unequal exchange i thought you were talking about more on the company side now obviously the government regulation plays a big role in, you know, pushing sustainability and things like that. I think you've got a bit of a contradictory narrative where, um, sort of, on one hand, you've got companies that are lobbying government, preventing all this good action from happening. But then, well, we do see a lot of environmental regulations, and we do see a lot of sort of sustainability pushes and what investment environmental in. <laughs> what? Well, do I mean, you think the entirety of the EPA and everything that they do? I mean, take the Clean Air Act that reduced emissions or sort of uh, air pollutants significantly in the United States, right? I mean, you might argue that like the coal or the banning or of CFCs whoever, and like the repairing um, of know, the uh, ozone layer, right? Or something, but it ended up getting. The worst part about these arguments here is that he's making the perfect the enemy of the good. Companies reducing carbon emissions, any amount good. Sure. Every passed, time, uh, I think yeah. it was the Carter administration. Right. Yeah, and well, a lot of them got sure, undone yeah. or weakened by future, um, by future uh, presidents. That's the thing, right? Well, well, companies sure. can pollute the ground, the water, and the air, and you can get people real, real outraged. And that outrage might lead to change in Washington. But how long before the people forget? You have clean air and water for long enough, and people start to forget. Public interest drops off. You know whose interest never drops off? Shareholders. Because while the public may have fought for X or Y 30 or 40 years ago, 
Eventually they'll get old and die and a new generation will be voting. And who's still there waiting for those people to forget? It's lobbyists. And they talk to the gov Jesus. government and they say, hey, you know. Cigarettes are coming back, honest boys. Honest to God, I don't think people care much anymore. Reduce this regulation, packages as part of a de-bureaucratization program. Say that it's investing in business, you know, say that it'll increase the GDP. God, I would fucking give this guy my whole YouTube channel. He would just say, well, Vosh, what if I were to tell you that companies reducing the amount of emissions that they uh, had wasn't actually a moral, uh, a moral obligation. It would just be super erogatory. <laughs> Fuck, it would be so good. And then they go ahead and do it. All these regulations got whittled down. We saw this with tax rates and the state. We saw this with everything. There is basically no regulatory element to the United States that has not been whittled away at with time. Corporations have an interest and an incentive to be permanently politically engaged. The people only react to what they can see and feel, and they will never see or feel what's happening in the third world. We spend billions of dollars billions. promoting a completely insular media space where we are utterly removed from the consequences of our economy to the rest of the world. So I, I think uh, it seems like your narrative would imply that environmental regulations are strongest uh, when they were originally proposed and passed. And I don't think that anyone would say that the EPA, when originally conceived under Nixon or under the Clean Air Act, when Carter passed it, is the time in which the United States had the most environmental and most robust uh, regulations, right? Of course, these regulations chipped away at the sure, gone. They get chipped away at well, but, time. So are you saying they were strongest no, no, when they were... Well, sure, but that, again, that implies that... that they were the strongest when they were first put away, in. Yeah. It does not become more than what it was originally was, right? And so I, I don't think that anyone in business or anyone in, in, in sort of common parlance would say that um, environmental regulations are uh, have only ever gotten worse since but the EPA in the I'm United not, States... I'm not had, saying they can been, only get worse. Public interest can you fuel. Said, well, that's what when you say only get. That's literally what you're implying. When you say that in there they were made in one way and then they've only been chipped away at a time, you're basically saying that they can only get worse. That's essentially what is being said, right? More, a climate change or regulatory laws, but eventually they do get whittled away. Get like pretty much I'm every sorry, yeah. major so you're... <laughs> environmental regulation. This guy is so polite. More than it's really annoying. Ago, has at least seen some kind of compromise thrown its way, has it not? I th oh, no, no, no. I didn't mean to sell No, it. not really. I mean, like, I think uh, maybe as a, I mean, as one example, for instance, okay, um, something that the Trump administration actually did. It was December of 2020, like right before they left um, kicking and streaming, I should say. Um, they because passed I'm a new tax credit for uh, carbon capture. Right now, obviously, uh, if you know, th there's no reason for them to incentivize something like that if they're just sort of in the pocket of the oil lobby. Obviously, we're talking about the Trump administration, for God's sake. So, you know, I, th I think that you, that is not, but one example. Wait, do you sure, not gone. think the Trump administration was in the pocket of the oil companies? No, no, no I so I, I, I'm not asking you necessarily to engage in that specific example. My point is that indeed Trump was a very much more pro-oil president than Obama or than Biden is currently. Um, my point is just to say that the narrative, and I, I think what would, well, I'm not going to suggest what you say, obviously, on your platform, but I think that in general, um, the, the narrative that environmental regulations only get chipped away and the only time that they're built up is as a result of some sort of uh, voter outrage. Um, it, it, you know, it might be true in large part, but I do think that right now, again, with the boom of ESG investing, uh, with uh, shareholders trying to make more uh, sort of actions and sustainability and diversity and good governance and things like that, um, I do think you start to see that uh, a, a little bit more push back uh, organically. Vosh, push and back. To bring it, last sentence that I'd say is that to bring it around to the original discussion on unequal exchange, I think that. Um, uh, it, 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 there is a place for government regulation, um, and I don't think that uh, e even if uh, you could say that companies won't do this organically, uh, I'm not sure, but um, I do think there's a place for government regulation, um, and I'm not sure that it's bore out in a modern context that governments are unwilling to uh, regulate that kind of thing. Okay, so a few things. How can Vosh get mad after this debate? This seems like the most, like, he's getting to preach so much. This has got to be, like, a, an awesome debate for Vosh, like, when he gets to talk and talk and talk and talk. Like, First of all, sure. I don't think Donald Trump passing tax credits for carbon capture really counts, because if he really cared, he would punish companies who push out carbon, not reward companies who don't. 
all carbon, all well, like carbon the capture. Wait, what? Those are, that's the there. Those are one and the same. Carbon credits. Oh, okay, whatever. I don't understand how. I don't understand how Vosh can understand some things and then just totally miss other things. It's really confusing to me. But not reward companies who don't. All carbon, all well, like carbon. The reward companies who who capture carbon. Obviously. All, yeah. All tax credits do, even if they're incentivized through carbon capture, is give more money to businesses, which is consistent with his entire policy platform. This doesn't hurt companies who continue the status quo when it comes to carbon production at all. It's just tax no, credits. It does, though. It, it it's does. It's opportunity cost. Yeah, it is. Right? Not, I mean, obviously, no, if you're no, no, of, capturing... No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt. No, wait, this is the dumbest thing in the world to argue. If all of a sudden, if there are 10 energy companies and then nine of them take advantage of a tax credit that makes them more profitable, then that one company that doesn't is going to lose investment. People aren't, because the profit margin is necessarily going to fall. They're either going to be outcompeted by capital investment because people invest in other countries, or they'll just be outcompeted on, on price because consumers won't buy from them, right? Bosch's argument is unironically as long as business is. Make money full stop, nothing they do will ever be good enough. The existing companies, they're not affected. All this, this, all this really is, is like, you can get some tax credits if you capture carbon dioxide this isn't a meaningful way of pushing people if you need you listen incentives are about the i think cap and trade economists view carbon credit i thought that carbon credits were one of the only things that um that economists actually support in terms of like can i find this cap and trade um igm form Let's see if I can find this on. Considering a broad range of cost benefits is a better tool for guiding climate policy than setting temperature limits, obviously, yes. Carbon taxes are a better way to implement climate policy than cap and trade. Carbon taxes are just, I, cap and trade is basically like a carbon tax where you can buy and sell your credits, right, I think? Think. Hold on, let me check this. Carbon tax versus cap and trade. Carbon tax cap and trade programs share several major advantages over alternative policies. Both reduce emissions by creating a low cost. Oh. In carbon tax scenarios, emitters must pay for every ton of greenhouse gas they emit, thereby creating an incentive to reduce emissions in the house as much as possible. With cap and trade scenario, emitters have the flexibility to reduce emissions in the house or purchase allowances from other emitters who have achieved surplus reductions of their own. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I guess economists prefer carbon taxes to cap and trade, but I'm pretty sure either of these are like heavily preferred to just like setting temperature limits or whatever that do nothing. Yeah. Carrot and the stick, okay? And this is a weak carrot and a non-existent stick. Um, I feel like you keep avoiding my general point in favor of snipping out like yeah. little exceptions. Get him, the vouch. general trend when it comes to environmental regulations is that you see a surge of their promotion, but you see them whittled away with time. Uh, not all of them ubiquitously. I'm not saying that the maximum environmental regulation we had was right when the EPA was formed. I'm only saying that as a trend, this is something that the public is not great at monitoring perfectly because it requires a near perfect level of continuous information on subjects that require a lot of expertise. Whereas corporations do. Corporations do yes. have a Green constant Adam. and yes. perfect understanding of the political situation with regards to environmental regulation. There are people paid seven figures to do exactly that. So not only do they have a material interest, they also have the means and the knowledge necessary to affect those changes. I need to see some evidence of American corporations, of, of the modern economic system, meaningfully and willingly limiting its economic output for humanitarian reasons, because I can't think of any. Governments will sometimes Based. do stuff like this with public outrage, but there is no public outrage for what American businesses do in foreign countries. Nobody cares. Coca-Cola was funding death squads and nobody gave a death shit. Death squads. It was a lefty meme on Twitter for like three months. That's it. Were they actually, I've, I've always heard this said over and over again, were they actually funding death squads? Is there more nuance to that story? I'm super curious. I've never actually like tried to look that one up before. <laughs> I wonder how true that is. 
Or if, that's a, if that gets a little bit exaggerated. I feel like it probably does, but... It's Americans have been taught not to care. We do not get taught about foreign countries. We do not learn about their leaders, their languages, their struggles. And we certainly do not learn where they get their money from. This is a deliberate... Deliberate. Not on every level, not every teacher. Oh, he realized he's about to say some crazy shit. A deliberate shit. <laughs> product of a political and economic isolationism that allows us to enjoy quite a bit at the world's expense. It's not like we've only done this recently and that we only do it economically. We do it in a bunch of ways. We've done it historically when it comes to the plight of the Orient, the foreign world, what we did and what we took from them. It's exactly what empires did back during the old colonial days when we literally sent soldiers abroad to go steal vases and portraits. This is, this is a continuation of a long-standing historical trend. All we've done is anonymize and abstracted it. And unfortunately, I think in a way, you're being an avatar of that like colonial force because you're arguing in essence, I mean, I'm sorry, but you came here straight facedly to argue that investors straight are going facedly? to be more green and more ethical in the future. So we should trust them <laughs> and make these changes. Loser. Take a, all what all an idiot. No, what a fair. fucking you moron. I was like, he they're did. not going to no. take a price hit. If it means humanitarian. Didn't, didn't say we should trust them though. Didn't well, say we should trust them. Just, just try to point to a general trend. No, so you asked, you again, it's, this might have been a misunderstanding of the question, but you asked, wh why would they do it? And so I point to the trends in ESG investing that are organic, that companies are engaging these pledges. Um, pledges. You know, you could say. Why not now? You can no, do it now. They could do God it sakes, right Vash. now. No, but, okay, well, Vash, I'm not. I'm not sure what you mean they could do it right now. I, again, I've, I've already conceded that if we were to get rid of unequal exchange tomorrow, we would, in fact, uh, see a recession and, and see that happening. My only argument is that it could be reformed over time, which you agreed with, to be fair. We're just having a more practical argument right now. So um, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should trust companies just take care of it themselves. Did you know scientists are working on bioengineering cows with more of the bacteria found in kangaroo intestines to reduce their fart footprint? I did not know that. I'm also, I don't know if I believe you, but. How many harvesting stations can go for one cultivator? I'm not a libertarian or an ANCAP or anything like that. Um, it's just to say that I do think there is an organic movement that um, can be part of the mix of that movement and also government regulations that ultimately lead to uh, unequal exchange being uh, eliminated to, to some degree, right? That uh, you, you can see worker parity uh, across the world. Now, to be fair, I'll say the exact same thing that you said uh, about socialism is that um, you know you said you don't see a socialist revolution happening anytime soon, and, and I don't see what I'm describing happening necessarily anytime soon either. Um, I, I just think that it's possible, and I think that we do see trends towards that direction. I, I mean, if the trend is corporations taking virtue signally pledges and not actually doing anything, then I guess, yeah. They've been doing that for a while. I thought he was a fan of, like, woke capitalism before, or is this somehow, like, fundamentally different? Or is this just Vosh saying Vosh things? I never know when to take him seriously. He's like Trump. Like, take him seriously, but not literally, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> like, that's just like a big PR move. But the, never in like the never in like the history of the market economy can I think of an example of a major corporation for humanitarian reasons, like limiting the, the stock price and the profitability of their company. I can I can just I can't think of it, and I can't think of the U.S. Well, there, the, the United obviously, States ever you, engaging in humanitarian investment abroad or do you regulating think companies, stuff like that. For no uh, he really should know the do humanitarian think, thing. Do you think Fuck. companies today engage in no social spending or like charity at all? I they, mean, char charities are tax loopholes. Oh God! Oh no! The, who is the guy? Our Econo boy? Ah! Oh, I hope he nails him on this one at least. Fuck! Ah! Oh. Okay, people, wait! Wait! No! Com Come companies, on, Come wait, on. wait, do you not know how charities work in the context of a lot of these, like, things? The I, reason, so char I do charities can incentivize yeah, sure, certain don't. forms of investment, they're good for PR, and they mean that you can qualify for some other stuff. No, companies don't generally, like, they, they don't have meetings where they, like, go to, like, stockholders and go, like, oh, well, I know you guys all wanted your prices to be X this year, but, you know, if we're gonna, like, actually just give a bunch of money to charity. Charity is usually just another component. The tax laws for charity in the United States are sometimes very beneficial to corporations. Now, I'm not familiar with, with any of these. All of the specifics on that. <laughs> with any of these uh, specifics. But I do know that there have been like write ups about it and the ways that they can use it to avoid some other potential economic problems. Like I can research it next stream so I have a more sure. particular understanding of the issue.
Yeah, no worries. I think I think obviously that would be very educational for for the stream and everyone. Um, it's really, but it's really my educational. point was to say that obviously charities do engage in a decent enough amount of you know sort of charity and social outreach right now. But the, obviously, it's the case that those are deducted from their taxes. But you're not getting like the value of that tax deduction is only the tax rate times the spending. You're not getting the full amount of spending back, well, and things. you're still spending more. No, Bosh, hold can't. on, to be fair. Bosh, you've copied so many of my arguments. You certainly couldn't have missed this one, right? This is like one of the easiest dunks on dipshits that are like, oh, they do charity, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's not like you're going to save more money than you fucking spend. You only save a percentage of what you spend on the charity. Like, this is so dumb. There's no way that you are actually making an argument. This is stupid. Come on, Vouch. You're better than this. Again, there are tax loopholes regarding charity, but I don't think it's the case that the overwhelming amounts or even some you know, uh, uh, even all, or certainly all of charity spending is just some crazy tax loophole by corporations. And the only reason I bring that up is because you brought, you know, can you name even a single example of companies sort of spending more money than they than they otherwise would need to um, on societal benefit or at the detriment of their share price? And is by that, I mean, obviously, detriment? cash flow return to shareholders. Well, obviously, when when you know share price in theory and typically in practice is the idea of you know future expected return in the form of cash flow, and when you're decreasing that amount uh, in the form of charitable givings, well, yes, you would you necessarily be decreasing the amount that your stock uh, would be worth, right? Now, um, that's all I'm saying. It's not a controversial claim to say that you know there's more than even a single example of companies engaging in in a, in charitable giving at the detriment of their free cash flow. Obviously, the money has to come from from somewhere um and that's that's all i'm saying i think that your absolutist position is necessarily it's got to be necessarily incorrect i mean you've got to see where i'm coming from with that right well no 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 not even slightly. so you you think no you you think no if, if company we're talking engages about, if, in, if we're talking about like chunk sure. change like if you take a look at major mega corporations and you take a look at the amount that they donate to charity the the idea that this in any way transposes onto like them being willing to incur like massive hits to their profitability um, uh, Destiny, the Coca-Cola thing alleges that a bottling company, which Coca-Cola owned 25% of the stakes in, assisted a paramilitary in taking out three members of a union group. The case was dismissed by the district court for being too far removed from Coca-Cola and that it didn't occur in the U.S. Interesting. I'll have to read about that later to make sure you guys aren't fucking lying to me. Uh, uh, it, it, no, for but, humanitarian well, hold on. Let reasons. Let me, let, 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 let me stop you right there because that's, that is not my point. My point isn't that companies would be willing to engage in, quote, massive hits to their profitability in the name of sort of social giving or charity. My point is that they would engage in minor hits to their profitability. And when we're talking about economic wide scales, unequal exchange is just not a big part of the economy. And it is not it unreasonable to assume 3% is, 3 is no, not a big no. part. I, I, look, right? I've been really nice to you, but I, I can't let this slide, okay? Oh my god, why Why is he so mad? This guy is like the most passive, polite dude in the world. Holy shit. I can't let this slide any longer. I'm gonna turn into mean, Vosh. It's 3% yeah, at, the it. at the costs we pay for their goods, which are undervalued because they're being s assembled by sweatshop workers instead of United States citizens. And sweatshop our manufacturing workers. and industry economy GDP percentage asterisk is around 18%. Asterisk equals, 3 let me stop you right there. percent out of 18% is one out of six, or around 17% in total. But it's worse than that. It's not just the industry that we receive and the physical goods that we receive directly. If you talk about the undercosting, it's possible that the imports that we get could contribute to a significant portion not only of our industrial GDP, but also to the services associated with them. All of the electronic goods and raw resources that we get from them for a dollar, like cents off the dollar, we then use sure. 20 times over in our country, you know? You may get oil from another country, but it gets refined and manufactured and sold and bought and used sure. and et cetera. Lumber, well, how many times does lumber get transacted once it reaches our borders? When I, when I say unequal exchange, what, Bro, you just got crushed. When I say unequal exchange, what, what does that mean to you? Uh -oh. The fact that we rely on the comparative degree of economic underdevelopment in the developing world in order to extract favorable business and trade relations from them. So it's it's a bit more specific than that. So un unequal exchange, and, and I'll, I'll say um, I'll say this is just the idea that say you know if if a, if an Indian worker can produce like one pound of wood an hour or something, and then an American worker can produce one pound of wood an hour, um, theoretically they on an exchange rate should be paid the exact same. But Indian workers are paid less per unit of production than like American workers. As an example, obviously I don't know about the wood industry in India or anything, but 
Um, that that to me is what unequal exchange is. And so when you say, oh, it's it's only three percent because uh, of the comparatively low living standards that we enforce, the reason I disagree with that is because that is, unequal exchange is literally taking into account that difference in pay. That if we equalized that difference, if the standard of of work and productivity was equal across countries, it is. Three percent of GDP. It's three percent. That's what it is, and that's no. a significant portion of the economy. No, if it's gotten rid of in one it's, year, it's three percent. If all the people assembling them were being paid American Union wages, no, no, it's not. No, no, no. It's three. It's no, no. Well, that's that's not what I said though. It's three percent. If Indian workers were paid per their productivity, because Indian workers or, or or global South workers probably are less productive on average. Wait, if you work in a factory so, for eight hours a day, whether you're in the United States or India. What is, what is the paid per productivity for an Indian worker working in a factory? What, right. what so is I that think exactly? that this is where well, I'm, I'm trying to explain. So <laughs> this is where I think um, it, I could illuminate a little bit more. So the reason that Global South workers are less productive on average than like Global North workers isn't necessarily because they're like dumber or anything like that. It'll be access to capital, education, work training. Don't work right or anything. Right. Um, part of it is is lack of educational yep. attainment. Sure, that that contributes somewhat to productivity, well, but also part a, of it is, is lack shame. of access. It's uh, a shame that there are international sure. loan sharks who discourage them <laughs> from spending government money on infrastructure like investment. Dude, he's like, he's so like ideologically dug in. He can't even have the conversation. He's like, he's just constantly looking for places like, how do I insert? Like, oh, I'm going to jab him, hit him with a left jab here about the CIA. Oh, strong right hook, bringing back the IMF. Like, oh, uh, left uppercut, bringing out a CIA Coca-Cola death squad. He's like, he's like not even like plugged into the conversation. He's just looking for places to like, get you know big ups from his audience on investment then huh well no not necessarily i mean i have already disagreed with that in in large part obviously global south nations have you know quality universities to go to and everything like that it's it's just a matter of overall wealth what what, what i was trying to say, well, <laughs> wait do they does he, does he think that like only europe and america have colleges <laughs> what was that what he said it quietly too wait what <laughs> disagreed with that in in large part obviously global south nations have you know quality universities to go to and everything like that it's it's just a matter of overall wealth what what, what i was trying to say well yes there are quality universities in india Vos, come enough, on, enough I mean, for the population really How, what, what's the, what's the average um <laughs> oh, okay equality is enough for the population i mean what does that even mean are there even enough high quality universities in the united states for the population i mean if everybody went to college probably not you probably have to increase class sizes dramatically or build more universities right that's kind of a strange way to phrase it but What's the average like educational attainment in India? Do you think it's comparable to the United States? They have like one point no, no, one that's, billion. I just want to point out using India as an example here is kind of funny. Now I'm sure India probably has a lot of like low um, educated people, but like Indians are, I'm pretty sure Indians are known for exporting uh, high quality workers to other parts of the world. Like we have like the whole thing about H1B visas where coders, like engineers in the United States are pissed off. He's like, fuck, here comes some more Indian people that are about to take our fucking jobs. It's not like India is exporting, you know, Amu, the, the gas YouTube station owner or whatever. That YouTube chat is better than all other chats combined. We are excited for your move to Sweden. Nice. It's not like India is just exporting low quality workers to the world. That's not what India is known for, you know, like that's like, if you have Indian workers, in, well, I wonder actually what, um, how could I look this up? Average Indian, uh, median wage USA. I wonder what the median wage is for the like ethnic group. Could I find this out? The median family earnings of Indians in the United States is $123,700, nearly double the nationwide average of 63,922. Jesus, about 79% of Indians are college graduates in comparison with a nationwide average of 34%. Now, to be fair though, um, average college attainment or um, let's see, Indian average college attainment, well, like for the, for the country of India. I wonder what that is. India has a publicly funded higher education system that is the third largest in the world next to the US and China. Jesus. As for the latest 2011 census, about 8.15% of Indians are graduates. They've added 20,000 colleges in the decades of 2000 to 2011, or in the decades of 2000 and 
to 2001 to 2010 to 2011. Okay, in that decade. In the U.S., it's like 30%, I think. So it is. They're getting there. It is, to be fair, I'm pretty sure India is considered like a developing nation as well. But people, I'm sure they have well, some. No, gosh, that, that's part of my. That, that's part of my point is that on average, Indian workers, and we're using Indian as an example, just Global South more broadly, workers are less educated. So that contributes part of which to their productivity that's less. But also part of it is uh, access to capital. So oh, obviously, pre watched. It's pre watched. How much do I have to donate to replace Dan as your friend? I am very rich, very smart, very good at debates. Um, I'll think about it moving math, okay? Uh, if you have like the latest and greatest machines available, your workers are going to be per unit more productive uh, than workers that don't have the latest and greatest capital available. So what's the number? All I'm saying is what's the number of what? The number of what? What is the productivity of an Indian worker? Um, you could probably um, look up like average I'm, productivity. Explain how it's relevant. Obviously, I don't know the exact answer to that question. Well, everything you're talking about right now is justifying us underpaying them. You know that, right? No, you're it's, saying, it's, you're it's saying, not at all. Well, no, no, it, it is. You're saying essentially no, that I'm, they're impoverished. I, as an advocate for getting rid of unequal exchange, I would advocate they should be paid like equal to their productivity. I've got no problem with that. That's you, been this entire argument that I've had this whole time. You can't weight their contribution to our GDP based on their perceived productivity if their productivity is already being weighted by the economic conditions that mean they're in the shitter. Well, you're begging the question there. Of course, if you're only paying them or assigning wealth to them based on productivity and their productivity is being lowered dramatically because they're in countries that rely on an unequal exchange, then yeah, but that's like circular logic. Then you could be like, oh, well, you know, why are you, why are you only- <sighs> Oh man, we're, <laughs> we're pretty, we're pretty lost in some bullshit right now. <laughs> oh shit. Only buying like a car from from India for one dollar, and you're like, well, you know, over there, it's it's one sure. dollar's worth of productivity to produce that car, and you're like, okay, how do you figure that? And you're like, well, they're very poor over there. It's like, well, yeah, I I know, <laughs> but like, what's the worth? Well, I can I can actually answer this question more specifically. And, and what does Vosh think they should question. be paid? So, I'm curious. Um, Jason Hickel, who I'm sure you've heard of, he he is an he he's basically an advocate that we should get rid of unequal exchange. He's an anthropologist, and uh, what he has found is that. Uh, even if you, you were to assume that workers are the same, like let's just say that Global South workers and Global North workers are, have the same exact productivity or like relatively similar productivity, um, the amount of that unequal exchange would be worth about 6.5% of GDP, right? So give you an olive branch there, it goes from 3 to 6.5%. So again, I think that even even Wait, with the, the most... the whole developing world? Yes. So <laughs> China even with the most... alone is half a trillion to the U.S., China. Which is um, which, no, which but is about... you're you're assuming you're you're assuming that every single time a good or a service is made in China, it is necessarily completely unequal exchange, and that it's all total exploitation. There's obviously workers in China that are paid reasonably well and are educated reasonably well, right? So that's the that, problem with that type of analysis. I think that most of China's industrial export relies on the uh, relationship that they have had historically with the West and their consumption of underpriced goods. Wait, well, the stat why, I can't, why can't it be the fact that China is just comparatively better at manufacturing some things? Are you, is it the claim really that the only reason we trade with China is because we can exploit them? Okay, hey, it said it wasn't going to get attacked for like 40 seconds. Why did these guys come so early? Fuck you. But I don't expect you to remember all these stats, obviously. The stat I quoted originally was that as a percentage of the, the whole waste entire of world's in GDP, the if you, if you assume shame. every single time someone from the global south makes something, and that is necessarily unequal exchange, it's necessarily exploitative, what is that percentage of the exports that are sort of um, of the world GDP? Um, it's 7.8%. It's of, of, of global north GDP, 7.8%. But that's such a crazy assumption to make uh, in the first place. And even if you made that assumption, why is uh, it a crazy assumption? 7.8%. Yeah, why is it so crazy? Well, because number one, China and the rest of the global south obviously trade a lot with each other. And so if we're concerned mostly with sort of the percentage of the global north GDP, um, it, uh, you, you know, you, you wouldn't make that assumption. Um, and also, just the idea that every single time any worker in China makes a product and then it gets exported to the global north, it's necessarily unequal exchange. It's necessarily incredible, crazy labor China, uh, exploitation. China alone, single-handedly, is 20% of our imports. 
You're telling me that if we axed out the entire global south, it would be charitable to me to say that the the global north would lose out on 7% of its GDP? I, I, okay, I don't... Well, I, I, yes. He's not arguing in good faith, Vosh. Hit him up with a bad faith. This GDP is weighted uh, uh, be significantly because uh, goods coming from these countries are often underpriced. So let me, so I can answer no, no, no. that question. Oh, wait, hold on, wait, so, wait, 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 we've gone over this for, we've yeah. gone over this for a it's while. It's too much. This is, this He's, is insanity. This guy's bad faith. It's, right, write him I, off. Wait, 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 Absolutely he said it was fair, fair Bosch. Just say it. If you say it enough times, it must be true. Of the Hold on, Dono coming through. You touched on it earlier, but I'll discussed touch the it. option to walk away from these loans. That alone is proof that these arrangements are mutually beneficial. Uh, uh, I mean, there can be forms of predatory loans, so we're going to be fair. Degree of inefficiency or, or underdevelopment that, or inefficiency that you would get from, um, fr from people in those countries. You're, what, what, what we're essentially talking about is what are we talking about and, and we're talking about industrial imports too so keep in mind most of the united states gdp 80 percent of it is like the service economy about 18 okay. percent yeah. of it is industrial we don't import the service economy we import goods so the goods we import are a significant portion of the raw resources no, I mean, that we use for construction no, 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 that, and Vash, industry in this that's country. That's not true. I, I've got to. I've got to stop you there. So, a big a big part of our imports are services. You can import a service as well. Um, and <laughs> like the, the what? Point Make him name to, one, Vosh. To, to get in on China is that um, when you talk about China being twenty percent of our, our our exports, well, let's just assume that you're right. Obviously, well, if you do if you do that percentage, right? So Chinese exports to, to the GDP. Uh, as a percentage of Are our you economy, serious? Um, you end up with uh, under one percent, right? And so, again, even even if you assume, I've, Wait, I've been, I'm trying to bring shit. it back to this system. Well, because if we import about eight hundred billion dollars worth of goods, twenty percent of that's about two hundred billion divided by twenty-two trillion dollar GDP. That's how you might get that that number. But um, wait, that's obviously wait, wait. a rough estimate on the fly. Sure. No, uh, I I just I don't think. He's not arguing a good faith. I'm gonna faith, be honest Vosh. with you. Yeah. I, maybe I should have like a, Say an it. economist on or something. I just yeah. The idea to me that you well, and other people are—you got me. <laughs> okay, maybe not one who will say that the IMF is a ar neutral arbiter. Um, That's this I, guy like, totally I, I said that, Vosh. Yes, to get know, like, yes. The idea that somebody could straight-facedly look at me and straight-facedly, like, yeah, dude. If we just cut out all <laughs> trade from the entire developing world, the parts of the world that we have literally gone to war with, and used like third-party organizations to control the economies of so they could be beneficial to our investment. Yeah. We could cut out all of that, and it'd be like a little recession. We had a massive recession from one building having a plane flown into it. I guess two buildings. Like, we we had more than a three- Wait. Was there a recession after 9-11? This guy keeps using fallacies and his points aren't salient. Am, did I forget? Am I- How old am I? Wait, what? <laughs> Okay. I, I must have missed that one. I was pretty young, I think. Maybe he thinks the 9-11 the yeah. started the housing crisis. <laughs> one building having a plane flown into it. I guess two buildings. Like, we, we had Two more, buildings and two planes, to be fair. More than a 3% GDP dip from the 9-11 from the attacks. It was a huge dip, and it took years to climb back up. And you're telling me that the entire two-thirds of the pop Just started watching Economic Boy. How good of a debater do you think he is? Uh, I mean, he's really, he's probably too polite. I don't know, because he just basically lets Vosh walk all over him. But I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, like, I say that, but he sounds like he's kind of like a Vosh fan. I don't think he came in here with the idea that this is going to be like fucking blood sports. I say that, like, from a blood sports perspective. I mean, it's an okay conversation. But, like, I think the problem is this guy came in, like, primed to um, have, like a, like, a calm conversation about some economic disagreements. But Vosh is, like, here ready for fucking blood. He's, like, waiting for population the, the global south we could just not and it would be like a temporary reshuffle equivalent to the harm that we experienced to our economy during covid that all that the fact that you, you can go anywhere in america and buy goods that say made in taiwan made in china whatever that's just 
it would just be a little bump. I feel like any reasonable economist would look at that and tell me, because I admit that I'm not like an economist or anything, but I feel like I've made some convincing arguments here. They would look at that and go like, are you fucking crazy? True. America had an economic harm done just by the tariffs to a couple of industries from China. You think we could cut out all the shit that we get from there? Are you insane? We would collapse. Are you insane? They would collapse. Are you Everything crazy? Collapse. Global trade is the only way that we can sustain like a, like like fair diplomatic relationships with half these countries anyway. It's probably the only reason why China's not willing to risk war with us over Taiwan, because they know that war, even if it wasn't nuclear, would still lead to a huge recession yep. for both countries. It, but but that wouldn't mean anything, right? If what it really was just some flippant little nothing and the West could just trade within the West and it wouldn't be like, we, we don't actually rely on all this stuff. So, I, so number one, we, we did not have... Uh, a 3% recession because of 9-11 um, at all. Our, our GDP didn't shrink by, by 3%. Um, the point that I was making- It wouldn't surprise me if like markets dipped, but I mean like markets dip. They Markets dip because of all sorts of stupid shit. They just do that because markets are irrational as fuck. It isn't justifying underpaying these global South workers. I'm, again, I'm making the opposite argument. I feel like you should be more charitable with me in that regard that um, we should in fact pay them Vosh is to the same lose level it. of their productivity or to parity the utopian now, view my... that everywhere in the world is same and everyone in the world should be paid the same no matter the geography, etc. Marxism FTW. Pretty dumb if he thinks that. Unless he was, yeah, unless he was actually trying to think of like the dot-com bubble and he thought that that was caused by, <laughs> by fucking, I guess it's, I don't know, maybe could he think that? I don't want to assume the worst, but then again, he's also fucking stupid, so. Point, bring up the six and a half percent, is that even if we assumed that, it, it, despite any knowledge or anything like that, if we assume that they're the same productivity, then the percentage of the economy that's based on uh, exploitation or, or like unequal exchange does go up to six and a half percent. And that's not a small, uh, trivial amount of the economy if we wiped it off the map immediately, right? My only point throughout this entire debate, which I, I feel like is, is fair enough, is that, um, in fact, it would be possible to do that. To survive. That it yeah. would be sustainable to do that. And we do see countries making steps uh, towards that uh, in that regard. Um, and if we assume a little bit more charitably that there are some productivity differences, it goes down to 3%. So, you know, no reason I don't think we, we, we wouldn't have this. And, and the last thing that I would say is that um, you say, oh, any economist would say this, this, and that. Look, forget about the education that I have, consider me an economist or not, but um, the people I'm citing are economists that are saying these things. The paper about 2 to 8% of GDP, you know, if the U.S. just totally shut off its borders, that was an economist from Berkeley and MIT. Not the right so economists I, 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 would disagree with that, right? <laughs> For well, instance, I find incredibly find my economy. the numbers you're citing here describe which percentage points that would reduce in the GDP. Because again, if we lost all of our lithium, what is that, a fraction of a fraction of a percent of our GDP? No, but gosh, no, no one's massive... talking about losing, no one's talking about losing all of the, again, the, the point of the paper about U.S. using losing 2 to 8% of its GDP is a theoretical construct if we closed our borders completely, right? That's not what I'm advocating for. What I'm advocating for is just simply worker parity across borders, which obviously I think you'd agree with too. My only point is you to say that Bush's if we did that, have that would represent about a 6.5% being no incredibly idea. charitable to productivity, 3 to 6.5% of... Of, of, of GDP and we wouldn't lose all of our lithium, we wouldn't lose all of our wood, our steel, we'd still get these goods, it's just that those workers would be paid a reasonable wage. Take him out, Vosh. Give him the kill shot. I don't believe it. Not for a single, <laughs> not right. for a fraction of a second. I think it's actually Fucking delusional. Fucking got him. Base, I think this is call like him delusional. shill shit that people oh my throw God. out there in an effort to justify the Neoliberal shill. Jason Nichol is a Marxist, to be fair. Well, I'd have to take a look at his like readings of this because I don't know if I can trust somebody's interpretation of a Marxist paper when they're like telling me the IMF is like neutral and their shit. I, like, I, I, I'm sorry. This is no, no, no. Oh no, my like, god, dude! Laugh, and I'm not he trying to be dumpstered him. Or anything like that. Good but, job, like, Vaj. No, I'm not. I'm not laughing. Take this neoliberal shill. Take him out. I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm I'm being as good faith as possible. Of course, no, I, he's I don't, not. I think this guy is the ultimate in bad faith I'm debating. I'm trying to as well. I don't know why I remember the. September 11th caused a dip here. It must have caused a dip in something else. Um, but <laughs> yeah, no, no it's what like, no. like property values in fucking Manhattan. Where's it? <laughs> I mean, like, what? Yeah, I mean, there's, I'm sure. I mean, like, and the number of mosques that appeared like in a 10 mile radius from the fucking X Twin Towers. Probably, yeah. There are definitely some dips caused. No, it's not. Um, chat. It's not the same. It's not the Jackson Hickle you think it is. Shut up. Anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. It's I just, made that mistake too. Yeah, it's it's a funny name.
Um, no, I don't believe it. Sorry, I'm yeah. gonna need more. No, yeah, that's good, is, man. This Fuck this guy. guy. Totally yeah, fine. your your country has spent the past this two and a half, and a half centuries. It's a fucking chill, dude. To secure economic control over the developing world, but actually, it's like very trivial, and it doesn't didn't actually matter that much anyway. And the amount of, the, God, of so our base. GDP that we would lose by not doing it is equivalent to like negating one year of growth. Maybe even not that much. Like you could basically hit freeze on the GDP growth graph for like nine months. Yo, and that would be enough. How do you get this shit to stop expanding? Cutting off trade from the entire developing world. That like to me, like I, I, I feel like, can you link those papers from, from, from Jackson Hickel? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. For sure. Um, well, all right. I think I think at the at the point of um, I just don't believe it. And I need to do more research. I, I feel like that's that's you said you had to get out about five thirty anyway, or five thirty Central Time. Um, uh, so I, you know, uh, unless you wanted to, to talk about anything else. Nah, don't talk um, to the show. No, I have to go. There's pasta waiting for me, unfortunately. What kind? Uh, it has bacon in it. That's all I know. It's probably rigatoni or something. <laughs> you say? All right. Well, that sounds good. Um, yeah. Uh, so I guess you know, closing statement. Obviously, you know laid out there on the debate. Um, I, I feel like I've, I've justified my points. I'll link you all those papers. Um, uh, thanks for, for, for letting me on, give me the platform. Uh, again, if anyone's interested in, in kind of a progressive capitalist uh, sort of interpretation of economics, you could say, um, that's my YouTube channel, Econoboy. Uh, and, that, and that's all I have to say. You take care, okay? All right, you too. Have a good day. Bye. Absolutely. All right. Stirred. We're on an unrelenting economic research arc until we find out why that guy was wrong. <laughs> okay. So I would say that's probably, so if you watch for my research streams, I would say that's probably not a good foundation to start from when it comes to doing research, uh, is to start with a conclusion and say, all right, we're going to look until we figure out why we're correct. Okay. Why does this shit grow? Is there, what is the source? Is there a source? Quest is to kill the root, and there's a map marker to south. Oh, find the root of the colony. Oh, it's probably that shit down there, huh? Oh, bro, you're a genius. Um, okay, the Econoboy... Oh, I don't care about this. The Econoboy added me, I just... I don't know what, we're, what we would talk about. <clears throat> yeah, I know Vosh saying you operate entirely off spite when he ended that with, I'm going to research things just to spite him. Well, to be fair, he's probably reverse. just me and me, right? I, I, we're being more charitable to him than he would ever be to me. I would assume he's just memeing there. God. Hey, what's up? What's up, Destiny? Wait, what do you um, what do you play? What do you play? Tell us. The real chat, what we really what? care about. You know, I, I don't play ever ever since leaving grad school, I don't play much of anything anymore. I'm a I'm a sad um you know, small YouTuber just trying to make it neat. Wait, do you have any music background at all? Okay, goddammit. Okay. So people ask me this all the time. Well your uh, Discord on symbol is an E flat. So I, or is it not supposed to be an E flat? Is that like some like postscript variable or some bullshit? All right, so this is how little background I have in music. I didn't know that this looked like an E flat, and the reason. Uh, so here, here's the logic. Um, uh, okay. I, I obviously watch Twitch streams, uh, and it's like, oh, how could I do you know Twitch or YouTube? Well, I know a lot about economics. Uh, so obviously, the first step for me was needed a logo. Needed my logo to be as simple as possible because uh, I'm no graphic designer. You can probably tell that by my thumbnails. Mm -hmm. And I figured, oh, what's something simple? So I used to watch uh, this streamer, I'm sure you know him, named Moon Moon, right? Uh, when he was a bit smaller. Wow, used and to watch him. What, why did you turn him off? Well, I, I don't have time to play Overwatch anymore. That's when he was big into Overwatch. So I just fell off of watching basically okay. video game streamers and started watching politics streamers. Um, and, okay. you know, what ended up happening was... Um, 
Moon Moon's logo, I think maybe it still is, but it was at the time, was like a moon and then squared for Moon Moon, obviously. And I was like, oh, I could do like a, an E raised to the B. You know, Econo Boy, um, I've always liked the name Econo Boy for like a username because I like economics. And so I asked my friend, uh, hey, could you do an E raised to the B? He's like a this sort of graphic designer kind of dude. And he told me he'd do it for free because it was so simple. But now people think that I am into music because I have an E flat as my as my logo now. So that's the story. Gotcha. Well, damn. Okay. Well, you know, I don't know how you came up with your logo. Obviously, plain old destiny. I mean, it's a long story. Is that man. all? You know, that's fair. You know, one question I've always wanted to ask you before I ask you about the Vosh debate is, how did you get the original Destiny accounts on everything? Like, just... Econoboy was a unique enough name that I just got the unique accounts. But how did you get, like, the original Destiny, like, like Instagram and, you know, stuff like that? Just uh, every, there's a story behind every acquisition, okay? It's a lot of work, all right? <laughs> a lot of ah, memes, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of unfortunate coincidences, but... um. Yeah, Was there know. any capitalist exploitation involved in achieving these usernames? Oof, more than capitalist. There was some just rough and dirty mm. stuff that happened, unfortunately. But, you okay. know, it's all part of the game of acquiring rare handles, you know? There was a, yeah. All right. For Twitch, well, though, I was like the first... The... I was like one of the first fucking streamers on this platform. So that's why I had it like a long time ago, you know? Oh, were you streaming in the Justin TV days? Bro, I was streaming... I th- Mm, was I streaming before Justin TV was a site? My first chat I streamed on was Livestream.com. Then there was Ustream. Um, and then eventually I did JTV. Yeah. Uh, I see, I see. So you, you, you actually predate Justin TV. You've been doing it for a little while. Maybe. I don't know if I would say I predate JTV because I don't know when JTV started. But I'm, I've been here for a while, I'd say, yeah. All right, all right. Um, no, I, you know, I figured I've uh, been watching you for a little while. I'll take advantage of this, this 15 minutes, uh, ask you some questions about the debate. Um, you know, how do you think it went? Um, well, I, from whose perspective? They're still growing. I even killed the thing. What the fuck, guys? From I'm guessing from your perspective? Uh, I guess from both of our perspectives. I mean, uh, how do you think uh, Vosh, right after the debate, he did a, you know, obviously I included the clip of him saying he was going to research until you research discovered stream. that I was... Yeah. Well, what that culminated into, I was actually curious. So immediately after our debate was over, he scheduled a research stream for later that night. Oh, um, damn. Okay. And he started it like three hours early. Um, but to be fair, instead of doing like research about the topics we discussed, he got really drunk and started just looking up poverty rates over time. Uh, so there, there wasn't a lot of... Um, I'm not sure Engagement he came to any conclusions. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I feel like I did pretty well. But how do you think I did? I'm, you know, that you're the you're the the godfather of of, of Twitch debate. So I, I'd love to hear some uh, some feedback. Um, I mean, I think you guys were there to have different conversations. So I think that that's probably why the conversation went the way that it did. Like it seemed like you wanted to talk about economics or something, and I think he was way more. Um, wanting to talk about like the political side of things so while well, you were kind yeah. of there to make kind of these just statements about um, economics or productivity every statement that you were kind of just giving as like a descriptive fact i think he was hearing more of a political slant to it than what i assume you were intending so for instance when you talk about like the differences in productivity between american workers who are highly productive um, versus workers in a developing country who are going to be far less productive for a variety of reasons. That explanation almost sounds like a justification for sweatshop labor. That's what it sounds like. Or I, I could see somebody hearing it that way. So I think that's... Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I mean, I, I think uh, someone in my, my comments did mention that... Um, I, I, he said that one of the issues that I think Vosh had in the debate was that he isn't realizing that from like an economics lens, uh, Econoboy is just making descriptive statements, not sort of normative and mm-hmm. prescriptive statements, right? And but it's impossible because leftists even misinterpret Marx and think that exploitation was like a norm- like a moral claim, <laughs> um, rather than just like a you know a, a description of like the relational values of labor and fixed capital and uh, value and all that. You know, I'm 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 not as familiar with sort of the I, I took I took uh, a class that had a sort of a very basic intro to Marx, but did Marx never claim that exploitation was like a moral wrong? 
Um, I, I believe in later works, he talked about it being a moral wrong, but in Das Capital, where he lays out the relation between fixed capital, labor, and, and value, it's, that's, not, that's not what, exploitation in that sense didn't mean um, like some morally incorrect thing to do. Mm. Okay, well that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's that's understandable. Um, I, I I guess to a certain extent, you know, you you mentioned uh, I was too polite. Now, I, on on one hand, my thought process going into the debate was, well, I I don't really see much room for a lot of passion. I guess like economics is a quite a dry subject. I guess and let, well, unless you're <laughs> talking to a socialist, right, where they or to anybody, to be fair, I wouldn't. Field. As much as I hate socialists, socialists aren't the only ones guilty of that. Like anybody, when you're talking um, different types of things, are going to like load the fuck out of you. It's like technically, ethics is a very dry subject, and incredibly the driest, most boring of subjects. But like an ethics mm. debate between people is going to be very fucking heated, obviously, right? I guess that's possible. I, I think, um, you know, I think, uh, I, well. I guess Vosh got his fair share of, of criticism after the debate, but, um, you know, I, 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 it seemed to be a, a decent enough showing. But, um, okay, so in terms of, you, know, you, you mentioned too polite as if it was a, obviously, sort of a negative. So can you extrapolate on that? What, you know, why is being, I can understand sort of in a social situation, you know, on, on the street, why being too polite might be bad. Obviously, you know, you get walked over and won't get your promotion, you know, stuff Yeah, like I'm sorry, before you go um, too far, I, I was half memeing when I said that. Like, I think you're, level, oh, I, I think you're, I was see. appropriate enough. When I said too polite, what I mean is that like, um, like Vosh was very aggressively minded in that conversation. Like he was playing very aggressively the entire time. And you were just kind of like trying to lay out like, oh, well, I'm just saying economically. And he's like, are you a fucking idiot? You're gonna deny me the exploitation of the IMF of third world countries in order to rape their population? And you're like, well, I'm not necessarily saying, oh, so you are a capitalist neoliberal fucking shill that's just here to shill for the worst form of economic <laughs> exploitation that's ever existed in the history of it. Like, so you're kind of like, on one yes. end, you're yeah, you're engaged in more of like a like a student teacher dialogue, and he's engaged in like a you yeah. know like I'm gonna fuck your face dialogue. So that's what I mean when I was like, oh, you're, you're being too polite. Yeah. That's true. I'm not. I'm not of. A, I know that in your debates you try to uh, match, match the other person's industry, but energy, I should say. But um, I don't know. I feel like you know. Don't you come off better if someone if someone is way more animated than you? Don't you come off better than that person most of the time? Um. Yeah. I think it just, I think it depends on, so I'm not gonna say that like matching tone is gonna give you like the rhetorical win every time. Um, and I'm not saying you should match tone, but you should be aware of your opponent's tone, I think is good. If you're, if you're going for like optical or yeah. kind of like rhetorical performances. Um, so for instance, like when I say like be aware of Vosh's tone, I don't mean like, all right, time to lay into this motherfucker, you know, time to whip out the PhD and make him define every fucking term that you know he can and like, you know, dig in really hard there. I'm not necessarily saying that. But what I'm saying is like, if you can tell that this person is being incredibly aggressive, then throwing in like, if you're like, hey dude, like calm down, like a few of those things <laughs> in like a relative, in, in like a minorly condescending yes. manner will make him look bad. Um, and then it'll force him to either like reconsider his approach tonally um, or at the very least, um, you still come off looking like sane because you're not freaking the fuck out. But um, now you've hurt his like aggression a little bit by highlighting that he's being needlessly aggressive. Right? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I guess for my strategy was more or less just moving past the tone entirely, um, it, you know, in general. Because I mean, there there were parts of the debate where um, I don't know if Vosh does this in like all of his debates. I haven't really like in the prelude to this debate. I hadn't really noticed this mm -hmm. as maybe a strategy or in sort of an implicit. Uh, subconscious thing maybe he does or a conscious thing i'm not really sure but um there were a couple times i don't i didn't interrupt throughout the entire debate except for when i felt like vosh was like really really uncharitably interpreting my arguments so there mm -hmm. were a couple times where it was like um you know oh i i don't know i think it's three percent of gdp unequal exchange um and you know part of that is like productivity differences but even when taking into account those you know global south workers still get paid less for their productivity and then Vosh comes back and says something like, you know, you're, you're, you're you literally justifying, justifying the, the idea yeah. that, you know, and it's like, well, not really, right? And, and that kind of got bogged down uh, into mm -hmm. the weeds. Um, the biggest criticism that I've, I have gotten, it seems to have been mostly good, um, 
has been the IMF uh, section of the debate, like that 20 to 30 minutes. And mm -hmm. um, I, it's hard for me to grasp as to why that would be. I don't know if you caught any of that, but... Yeah, so um, the so on the alt right you've got like the Jews, and then on the left you have like the CIA and the IMF. Like that's their that's their big like conspiracy. Basically, the IMF only exists to serve as like this exploitative, evil, um, neoliberal institution to destroy and fuck over third world countries. Like that's it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So when he brings that up, if you give any sort of um, what sounds like conciliation. Uh, in regards to the IMF, it sounds like you're shilling for the destruction of the third world, basically. I guess so. I think that the, the trouble I had in that section was that I didn't want to get into like an in-depth discussion on the IMF, not because I sort of was would be unprepared to have that discussion. It's just, it's not really what I came there to talk about. And I feel like at the point when you're like, there, there was there was five minutes of that 25 minutes where Vosh mm -hmm. was just reading from the Wikipedia page of the, the IMF, IMF, and I'm not really... <laughs> Well, yeah, it's just like I'm not sure how to, you know, I'm not sure how to uh -huh. engage in this. You're not, you're not, you're literally not making your own arguments. You're just, you're reading from a wiki page, and mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that's why throughout the whole 25 minutes, if if anyone rewatches it, you'll notice that pretty much the entire time, I'm fundamentally just repeating myself. I'm just trying to say the IMF is a bank. Mm -hmm. That is what it is. That frame of view encompasses more so and explains more so directly the actions of the IMF. Not that they're mm -hmm. like an arm of neocolonial regime change or anything like that. Yeah. Similar to how, if you view the CIA as just an institution that wants to, you know, secure business interests for the U.S. and fuck over communism, it wouldn't make sense the actions that the CIA has taken that would be sort of counter to that ideological motivation, right? Mm -hmm. So what is your um, national security view makes more sense. Are you, do you have your PhD or are you working on it or? No, so... Um, I, I actually, I used to have in my profile my exact education, but I took it out because I was like... Easy to dox. I don't know. I just, well, I mean, maybe. I mean, I think, not super concerned about getting doxxed or anything, but I, I think it's more so that I don't want people to think that I'm, like, bragging or anything like that. But anyway, to, to answer the question, I don't have a PhD. Um, I did... My master, I did two master's degrees. So no, right I did a master's in economics and a master's in finance. And my undergrad was poli sci mm -hmm. econ. But, you know, at the point of doing grad school, your undergrad doesn't really matter as much. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's what I did. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sort of focused on various topics during that time, but not a PhD. I don't have that sort of depth of knowledge mm -hmm. uh, myself. But gotcha. But you did econ. What kind of econ? A, For master's, you must have specialized a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, to a certain extent. So my economics uh, master's degree was fairly applied. So I didn't have, um, I don't have as much like theoretical foundation for my economics master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, so like if someone were to ask me, I don't know, hey, walk me through this like game theory uh, calculation or, you know, do the uh, the Nash equilibrium. It's like, dude, I, I did that in undergrad, fucking hated that part of economics. I was more interested in the statistical side. Um, in that regard, I focused mostly on like programming, um, in terms of actual economics, uh, Chinese credit markets was like very specifically the thing that I focused on. Gotcha. Um, and maybe healthcare policy stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in finance, uh, finance, I would say that I focused mostly on like valuation and energy. So during my finance degree, I did probably about a half a dozen commissioned kind of research projects uh, regarding energy deployments, uh, mostly in the uh, on the renewable side because that's kind of what everyone's interested in so mm -hmm. um you know my my youtube channel kind of came about from after i finished grad school the the one, one of the biggest lies they'll tell uh kids a lot of the times is life gets so much harder when you become an adult and to a certain extent that could be true but in my experience I, when i like became an adult and finished grad school which was about a year and a half ago i'm 24 um i i really just had a lot more free time sure and so after I got done with my, you know, grad school, uh, had a lot more free time, figured, you know, I'd start this YouTube channel and, um, uh, in part for education, do a lot of scripted videos, but then in a part for partially for fun, I just like doing debates and stuff. And these sorts of conversations are hmm. just fun for me. So something that I would say that is going to come up a lot, if you don't, if you're not ready for it, that's very frustrating is, um, you don't get right. to have very many conversations about topics divorced from the morality behind those topics. 
and everything becomes very heavily moralized, uh, which is incredibly frustrating, especially if you're talking about anything related to economics or finance. So for instance, a statement like rent control might not be an effective way of helping low income people secure housing, that statement is translated to, I fucking hate poor people and I hope they can't afford anything because I want them to die. Or a statement like the productivity of US workers is generally much higher than the productivity of Indian workers. Um, your statement is essentially saying white US people are worth more morally than these disgusting brown Indian people and you hate them and you want them to be poor and suffer. Like these are how all of the statements run through people's minds and it makes it impossible to have any type of policy or econ or finance discussion without just immediately people jump there. So like, for instance, like I don't like corporate taxes. I think they're stupid. But I, I think that like, um, I think income and capital gains taxes could see a big bump. Yeah. But like as soon as I say like, I think corporate taxes are an ineffective way of raising revenue. Oh, it's because you love corporations and you want them to steal and loot and pilfer all the money out of like US taxpayers and not pay anything or their fair share and blah, blah, blah. Like that's all people hear. And it's like, okay, well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think my, actually my second uh, to most recent video that I released was, uh, or well, like scripted video was actually about corporate taxes and how it's uh, not the most effective tax in general. But um, uh, that was the, uh, th that was the video that I, I thought I would actually get more pushback on because it's quite a, you know, I consider myself a progressive sort of economic thinker, you know, certainly uh, quite far left in terms of like the average American voter. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm like, a right-wing conservative compared to some of these Twitter people. Online, yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah. It's insane. Uh, but that's that's just to say that uh, even amongst sort of progressive economic thinkers, you know, Elizabeth Warren, you know, people like uh, Robert Reich, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, lowering the corporate tax is not a position that they would hold, which is one that I espouse in, in the video that I made. And so mm -hmm. uh, something I'd like I'd be that curious because sometimes sort of, when those economists talk, sometimes they keep in mind like political efficacy as well. So in that sense, like I might yeah. defend corporate taxes because they look good, people like them. Um, it's hard to attack them politically, or, or I'm sorry, it's hard, it, yeah, it would be, like if you came out and you're like, I wanna lower corporate tax rates, I guess unless you're a Republican president, right? Like it's probably gonna be seen as kind of unpopular. Um, so yeah, I, I can understand why they exist in the way they do, but. No, that's true. That's why people, <laughs> like economists should be mindful that there's always a third axis at play in their, in their analysis, which is the political axis, right? So mm -hmm. like we can, we can have like very esoteric arguments of, you know, oh, like it'd be great if we like lowered the corporate tax to almost nothing and, or like a very marginal amount and just raised capital gains taxes or, oh, it'd be great if we had like a uh, union sectoral bargaining and no minimum wage yeah, because that's like probably Norway more efficient. Or, yeah. yeah, exactly. But that the reality <laughs> is, is that that's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So if you have in front of your desk, like, hey, we've got this big infrastructure bill and it includes a corporate tax increase. Well, even though I just said what I said, if I was a congressperson, I'd vote for it. And even though I just said what I said previously, if I had a bill on my desk that was like, uh, you know, $15 minimum wage across the country, well, I'd probably vote for it. Yeah. Right? Even though it's I, like perfectly not the most efficient, maybe mm -hmm. economically, um, which can be frustrating for, for economic, you know, sort of thinkers, but uh, also it's, it's, it's just the reality. It's like yeah. when, it's like when, um, like, it's. I think it's one of the reasons that cin cinema, reasonably, I think it's criticized a lot more than Mansion because cinema is in a, you know, a, a, a tilting more blue state, mm -hmm. uh, and Mansion's in like one of the reddest states in the country. Mm -hmm. So you know, might be a little bit more understanding if Mansion's more conservative than. Uh, than cinema is mm -hmm. so one thing i'll like say that. for cinema because for the longest time i try to figure out like i understand why mansion is the way that he is and it's just a political reality you have to work around i accept it um i couldn't understand yeah. um cinema because there's another blue democrat in that um in that senate mark kelly yeah and Astronaut. they are um very much more progressive than cinema is but apparently yeah. if you do i don't know if this is a, it was either a 538 article or it might have been a vox article that i read um, when you break down cinema's actual like voter base she draws from very 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 different people than kelly um and her, no, her voter true. race is like way more like conservative independent leaning so like theoretically she could be far more progressive but it would involve her discarding her entire current voter base in the hopes of picking up the more left-leaning progressive one which is probably not going to happen so as much as i fucking yeah. hate cinema's obstruction to everything which is so frustrating <laughs> um but yeah fuck i thought we were going to have this bill like over a month ago well you probably <laughs> like cinema because she's a neoliberal shill and you just you know don't want 
to get yeah maybe but there's like there are parts of like the political discussions <laughs> and how people vote are so divorced from um are so divorced from everything else I, like i actually even fell for the price tag initially the 3.5 trillion i didn't even realize the spending was over 10 years for like a month i just didn't when i looked at the numbers i was like this is fucking <laughs> awesome dude i didn't realize we were making so much yeah. fuss over 350 billion i mean it's a lot of money sure but yep. man fuck dude it's and, always over 10 years yeah. yeah and then people are trying to like say we have like all these dumb like oh it's got to be tied to like budget increases and tax increases and like fucking all these like work test requirements or whatever for everything or the work requirements like man dude can we just like fuck off with all this stupid bullshit like god it's there's just so much yeah. junk <sighs> yeah no i agree i think it's it's it, it's an interesting test case i think that i think that two senators that aren't getting nearly enough credit uh as they should be mm -hmm. are warnock and 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 uh oh fuck who's the other guy that one in georgia Ossoff, yeah mm -hmm. um warnock and Ossoff have been 100 percent party line democrats ever mm -hmm. since taking office and they've actually both championed their own initiatives that are quite popular. Um, uh, Ossoff, for instance, is doing a lot of work on uh, solar manufacturing and, and, and solar paneling, right? And mm -hmm. then Warnock, I think, is doing a lot of work on voter rights, right? So they each kind of have their own base to a certain extent, and they also have their own initiatives that they're working on. Mm -hmm. But they're also working on them in, like, the slightest of purple states. Like, Georgia's been a red state for, like, 25 years now mm -hmm. right and um obviously they just recently went you know you could call them purple but they just went double blue in the senate race because mm -hmm. of the two elections simultaneously and um they've they appear to have taken totally different strategies in cinema mm -hmm. right they're not trying to play at all to conservatives they're taking what is like more the mark kelly idea which is i have my base of democratic leaning voters and i'm just going to kind of rely on them to come out and support me when the time comes mm -hmm. and you know, we'll see how that works out. I mean, Mark Kelly's up for re-election in 2022. So is Raphael Warnock. And, you know, if if both of them lose their elections, well, I mean, fuck, maybe to a certain extent they're right. Cinema's not up until 24. So, you know, we'll see how that goes, I guess. But Cinema's biggest problem right now is that she's polling like at 25% in the Democratic primary in Arizona. Like nobody likes Kristen Cinema. Like if you're a Democrat, why would you like Kristen Cinema? Right? Yeah. So she's currently tanking in those primary polls. So I think... I mean, I'd imagine eventually she's going to have to understand that, you know, you you have to make it out of the primary, right? This is what every Republican across the country realized uh, as a part of the Tea Party movement and in, in regard to Donald Trump, especially like your first priority is the primary and it always has to be in, in American politics, mm -hmm. right? If it's not, well, you can't win, yeah. right? Um, and so, you know, I I, I I would imagine that Kristen Sinema hopefully would, would get that through her head eventually but um but anyway back, back to your broader point i do i do agree that people moralize to to a great degree in in economics um i'm just not sure necessarily what the most effective way to respond to that is right so uh one of my friends said that uh one of my actual like real life friends um they still exist uh he said that you know in the in the debate you had with vosh um you isn't you or me as in you isn't me it, oh, uh, the not the Roy you, the the you that's uh, like my friend referring to me. Okay, uh, you. you. Gotcha. Okay, um, sorry. Just making sure. I understand. Yes. So which debate you're talking about? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so my friend said, you know, in the debate that you like, meaning me, had with Vosh, um, I can see how people would say he was like more rhetorically effective because mm -hmm. he's giving like a much more impassioned sort of Help broad the poor. scope. The IMF you know, is excellent. Yeah, exactly, yeah, kind yeah, of thing. Gosh, and yeah. whereas I'm giving like what I would argue is a much more factually accurate take uh, in a much more sort of apathetic, sort of calm way. So, I mean, how do you how do you mesh both of those realities at the same time and come out on top? I think that, so, I think that when you're going to have these types of conversations, you have to, like, be very focused on outcome, and you've got to hammer at home over and over and over again. So, like, saying things like, hey, like, I want to get this done. Like, your plan doesn't do what you want it to do. Right. And then try to find like a few edge cases where it's like, look at what happens with your plan. Look at this. This is bad or whatever. So like, for instance, like, and it's hard because like, since I try to work on my rhetorical effectiveness, now no left leaning person wants to debate me because they don't like to look bad because I'm like a literal Nazi on the internet. So it looks really bad if you look bad against me. Um, so something I'll try to do is that like, let's say that we're arguing for rent control, 
Um, I, like my argument might go like, well, let's have a factual back and forth about the rent control. And then the examples that I'm gonna pull from are, you've got you know single people that have three bedroom apartments in New York that never wanna sell or move because they're in such a privileged position. Like, do you think that's good? Or you've got poor people that wanna be able to move into LA or San Francisco, um, you know, and these poor workers can't do it because you've got wealthy people that are hogging these rent controlled units because they don't wanna leave. They don't even live in these units. Sometimes they just move away and they hold on to them. Um, so like being able to hit hard with examples is really important because it's the only thing that humans grab onto our examples nobody likes or cares about data unless you're a weird data person um <laughs> yeah so no that's true uh if you guys have ever uh w one of the one of the greatest debates from my perspective as like a data person was when this guy named alex narasta debated tucker carlson on his show about immigration mm -hmm. and it's it's a perfect it, you know it's it's very emblematic of what you just said where Every single thing Tucker said, Alex Narasta is immediately like, well, you know, this stat, that stat, what you just said isn't true. Um, you know, here's, you know, here, here's how we can frame it more positively for immigration. He's from the Cato Institute, so it's immigration. Yeah, super and, immigration. Um, yeah, and uh, he's like a total open borders kind of guy. Cato and, Institute, yeah. Uh, Loved by Republicans yeah. until it comes to immigration, in which case all libertarians magically become yes. fucking authoritarian, like anti-immigration advocates, protectionists, yes. socialists. Yeah, it's insane, man. Well, the Cato Institute loved by Democrats when it comes to immigration. And then hated when it comes else. to things like any economic <laughs> yeah. policy whatsoever that advocates for yeah less friction in markets and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. But that, that's like, I'm, I, guess, I guess I would just struggle to find those sort of ground level examples when we're talking about like such an abstract concept. I guess the argument could be that, um, you know, well, we'll I, I guess on one hand, he seemed... He, I don't know. Vosh made like a series of odd sort of stepladder type arguments regarding like corporations. He never really addressed the point on ESG investing, which I thought was pretty core to my argument. But I think at the same time he was saying, well, um, like, have there been like any moves? I talk about a move, you know, Chase Bank going to the renewable energy sort of uh, portfolio standards. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's just a pledge. You know, what, what's an example of a company doing something today? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, oh. companies engage in charitable activity today. And it's like, okay, well, I didn't well, know well, this, but that's not even a lot of their money. Like I want, what, what yeah. is like a significant, he wants them to suffer. Apparently people were saying there are multiple yeah. big tech companies that have reached net zero energy and are looking to move negative. I didn't know that. Apparently Microsoft nah. and Google are both net zero in their emissions or whatever. I knew that there were companies that were net zero, but obviously he's ta he's asking for a specific example. But I think the mm -hmm. the reality is in that debate, even if I had said, "Oh well, you know, Google and Microsoft are net zero. Microsoft's mm -hmm. been net zero for like almost a decade now." I think he would have just said, "Well, well, of course Microsoft's net zero, right? They don't have like a carbon intensive business model. Like, I need an example of like a business that is carbon intensive." that does a shitload of cuts for their carbon energy, not because of investor demand, just you know because they wanted to do it. And you need to prove that like that hurt the business. And it's like, well, I don't- I, You're never I, gonna satisfy. I don't need, yeah. well, yeah, it's like, I don't, I, that, number one, that's, that's probably not true to be fair, but it also doesn't have to be true. Mm -hmm. Like you, you see, like for instance, the, the major oil companies are some of the biggest investors in like renewable energy. That's not some like neoliberal propaganda. It's that's true. And part of it's because they see the writing on the wall. Like they want to get into these emerging industries mm -hmm. because they don't see oil and gas being sort of, you know, the, the next hundred years being sort of the energy uh, company mainstay. You know, they still want to be around in a hundred years and yeah. they're not going to be if they focus on oil and gas. Um, some of the biggest investors in carbon capture have been oil and gas companies, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that, that that's one example, but I just, I, I think that it, like, the thing with ESG, ESG investing sort of proved the idea that um, you can actually make profitable investments that are socially conscious at the same time. That's why it's, you know, that's why it's a boom. Like, mm -hmm. it's sort of a new realization for uh, the market. Um, but, Anyway, I, I thought that was that was a, an interesting sort of portion of of the debate. Um, but I, I did I did I guess I, I would give Vosh credit that I don't I don't really recall um, I don't recall Vosh ever having like a real like a as dense an economic debate as this was. Like he doesn't really talk about economics as much. Yeah, uh, I guess the thing that kind of irritates me though is that like, and I hate to say like econ 101 because everybody always throws it around and sometimes they say really dumb things with it. But like, I think there are a couple of like really fundamental concepts. I wish some, I wish everybody kind of knew so we could start from a similar place. Um, so like one huge one for instance is like economics is not a zero sum game. And I like Marxists have that approach 
because of how they view like labor and exploitation. So every single like labor plus capital union is necessarily a moral evil because some capitalist is like scraping pro or whatever. Uh, but like th this, yeah. I, if if people would start like if like that's one foundation. Like hey, you know like. In economic transactions, you can have two winning parties. Like that's totally possible. It happens all the time. Um, that and like basic concepts like comparative advantage. Just because one country is manufacturing something else doesn't mean that there is like some inherently horrible evil process going on. There might be a variety of reasons why they're just better at manufacturing that particular thing. And there's nothing wrong with capitalizing on those advantages. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think like a few things like that could just, all of the conversations about this stuff just suck. They're just so horrible because like people are so dogmatic it's, in their approach to it. And it's like, if a capitalist country is doing it, the only possible reason is because they're fucking evil and horrible. And it's like, <laughs> all right, dude. It's hard to it's hard to take into account all of like the dynamics at play in an economic system. So like um, one thing that Yori from the Money and Macro YouTube channel who, um, like we we kind of started doing youtube around the same time but he just fucking exploded way past me because to be fair his videos are way better edited uh, uh -huh. than mine are um but he uh he, he commented on the video and we we kind of keep in touch and one thing he pointed out was um well you could actually make the argument that capitalists would want to end unequal exchange depending on the firm because obviously if there were worker parity that would mean that workers in the global south are getting paid the same like relative to their production or potentially, you know, just equally to workers in the global north. Well, that would mean lower wage costs for domestic firms as those wages equalize over time. And that would mean that those firms would either have like more cash flow to return to investors or they would have more cash flow and retain earnings to spend on capital expenditure mm -hmm. um, or they'd have more access to capital markets. And so it's sort of like, well, if we it's like the Trump trade war, like you can raise tariffs and protect an industry and while it's true that that's bad for like most people, there there is a portion of workers who retain their incomes and their high paying jobs that does contribute to economic activity. Um, one thing that, for instance, in your um, uh, your debate with Big Papa Fascist about immigration, that I was sitting in my chair, I was like, he's, I don't know if he knows this, he's got to mention it though. Uh, is uh, he kept on drilling you about well, you know, well, well, why is it that you want uh, you know, small businesses to uh, or why do you want uh, middle class workers to get lower wages because they're competing with immigrants? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, the first part of your response was perfect, which was that, you know, it's not exactly clear that that's even the case because as demand comes in with immigrants, that sort of negates a lot of the downward pressure on wages. But mm -hmm. even if we agree, which was the second part, I wish you had, you had said, which was that even if we agree that there's like very marginal, depending on the actual industry decreases in workers' wages, that's not necessarily the worst thing because artificially constricting the pool of labor and forcing businesses to pay higher wages constricts their ability to spend on capital and technology, which is I the think, two other long-term pieces of economic growth. So which hurts the economy and while that's culture. true, it is such an entirely pointless argument to bring up because to most people, every corporation is running on like a 200% profit margin or some profit <laughs> margin that's infinitely deep that they can well, just well, draw maybe. money out of. And it's like, oh, because even Vosch said this in your debate, and you'll hear this from, from Marxists so many times, like, well, why can't they just take a cut to their profits? Why can't they just take a cut to their profits? And it's like, I, like I, if you had the time and the patience and if the person was willing to like actually function in good faith like it's if you have 10 companies one company takes a hit in profits i'm i'm explaining to the audience you know this right like nobody's going to invest in that company yeah. they're necessarily going to go out of business whatever good they're trying to do is instantaneously negated because now they've given up their entire company um, you can't you can't expect companies to just take this like unilateral hit there has to be like a combination of pressure from the public and pressure from the government in order to do so like yeah you, you can't just do something and just there, there aren't infinite profits to draw from you can't just do that but um, right. Yeah, people. Seem, I guess my yeah. my, I, I would have said that. Uh, what I was gonna say was that, that is maybe true if you're speaking to like a socialist that might fall on deaf ears. But um, obviously, big papa fascist in theory is like a right wing sort of, you know, could say more business oriented guy. I, I would assume mm. that that would no maybe make more sense to him. The the newer right wing and extreme right wing, everybody post 2016 got swept up hardcore in the kind of like populist stuff. So everybody hates big business and shit now. Everybody hates large corporations. Well, the new Republican Party is I, not the neoconservatives of old. I don't know. No, that's true, but mm -hmm. I think I think right wing populists hate big business not because they're sitting on their mountains of profits and like starving the global south or anything. They hate big business because they're like woke 
you know, culture war enabling, you know, conspiratorial, you know, propaganda pushing organizations and stuff. It's not more on, it's less on like the accounting side and more on sort of the PR side. It no, seems I think like the right wing opposition. I think it's totally on the accounting side. It's just more domestic rather than international. Like if you were to hook up a right wing populist, they would probably agree with the vast majority of Bernie Sanders economic views because Bernie Sanders is relatively protectionist in his economic outlook, or that was my remembrance of it. Like he was in favor of like us preferred, you know, manufacturing for things or protecting us jobs and protecting us industry and everything. Um, Bernie was definitely in favor of that. And, and Trump echoed some of the similar sentiments so he's you know, off in his own fucking world but I, I think that the right-wing populace yeah. of today definitely have a more a, a softer approach towards like and especially when you get online you talk to some of these fascists or like nazis or third positionists a lot of these guys will outwardly say like yeah like i think universal health care in college would be awesome i just wish it was only for white people you know like they'll be on board with it they just want to <laughs> restrict it more for who it goes to yeah i, I have you ever heard of uh, john fetterman no i'm not so John Fetterman is the lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania, and he is he ran for he was the mayor of Braddock, which is like a super duper tiny town on like the edge of Pittsburgh. Okay. And there's like 1,500 people that live in Braddock. Okay, just to give you some some scale to it. And um, he's this big like six foot eight like goateed muscly dude. And well, not. He's quite a quite a big man. I'm not sure how muscular he is, I should say. But okay. um, he he ran for Senate, and he's a super progressive, like, biker-looking dude. And he ran for Senate in 2014. And I think it was 2014. or No, it was 2016, and he lost in the primary. And uh, he ended up running in the next two years for lieutenant governor. And because of first past the post, you know, you, in Pennsylvania, you just need the most votes. So he got, like, a third of the vote but that was the most votes. So he ended up going and becoming the Lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania. And so his, uh, his, his, uh, his like Lieutenant governor's portrait is him wearing like a fishing shirt. He never wears a tie, never dresses formally. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason I bring him up is because I, I wish that I think the best strategy for Democrats to reach out to like conservative voters is what John Fetterman does. And to a certain extent, what he does is he'll go to conservative voters and essentially campaign like this. He'll just essentially say, well, look, we're obviously not going to agree on a lot of social issues. Like I'm pro gay marriage. I'm pro trans. Like I don't hate immigrants, you know, stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we probably, you know, maybe marijuana should be legal. Maybe that's a social Shut issue we agree on. Moving, right? mm -hmm. But what we definitely agree mean. on is like you, you, all you. the economic stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you want like high speed broadband in this rural community? Well, it's only the Democrats that are pushing for it. Like, do you want infrastructure investment in your roads and bridges? Well, it was like mostly the Democrats that passed that bill, right? Do you want like college education so your kids that grow up with less opportunity than urban kids get that opportunity? Well, it's like the Democrats that are pushing that. And so I, I, I think that that's one, if not the only way really for Democrats to bridge that sort of anti-corporate, you know, divide and actually pull over these like right wing people to to get them to vote for them because obviously you're the idea of like an anti gay marriage pro life democrat is just that's just not a thing anymore you can't be a democrat if you believe in those things for the most part mm -hmm. um and we'll see how John Fetterman's campaign goes. I mean, he's leading in in pretty much all the polls that I've seen. But yeah, I mean, you know, I'd be interested to hear what you think of that. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. I think that Democrats ceded a lot of ground on things that they shouldn't have. This is one of the reasons why I was hoping that I hope I hope I hope that we get this infrastructure bill out before the midterms. Is because I think Democrats I I think they're winners on most economic issues. I think that most Americans, especially past Trump, are ready to move on. Hopefully, from like the big like we need to give infinite tax breaks and help to corporations and we're just going to do this over and over again and see if it works which it clearly fucking doesn't um and that's that's why i was so excited for the infrastructure bill but god damn dude if we would have just had like fucking two more senators <laughs> or, or or even like what like even like one more senator like fuck dude trying to do things with 50 senators is just a goddamn fucking nightmare holy shit and if we don't get yeah. the infrastructure bill passed i don't know man i I, have, I think 2022 is just a total toss-up. I think anything could fucking happen. Nobody knows. Um, no, no. If, I, I disagree. Uh, if we don't get the infrastructure bill passed, 2022 is going to be a, a bloodbath. It's going to be a disaster, I think, yeah. um, for Democrats. Um, I think, to be fair, there's, I think there's more hope than, than lack thereof, uh, of hope, I should say. Um, I think Manchin 
I think it was today he announced like he expects a deal to be reached this week. And uh, to be fair, if Manchin's saying that, I I think that as much shit as Manchin gets, I, I I've never really found him to be like a liar. You yeah, know what sure. I mean, yeah. like he, he he doesn't seem to be like an unbelievably dishonest politician, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just say, and, and like he's not like Ted Cruz, I should say. Um, and uh, so I, I think there's hope. Um, the only hope that would be diminished is if like the price tag is so low that progressives are like, "Fuck that! I'm not voting for one trillion dollars towards you know social safety nets. I wanted three and a half trillion. I wanted six trillion. It's like okay, well." Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, the guy from West Virginia is kind of calling the shots. I mean, we, we all hate it. Nobody likes it. OK, but that's fucking how it is. And, uh, you know, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather the portions of the bills that are agreed upon get passed than like none of those bills. Because what's on the table, because they link the two, isn't just three hundred and, you know, fifty billion dollars a year or something in social spending. It's also uh, I think it was one point nine trillion. So it's. And it's 1.9 trillion over five years. So you're talking about like another, uh, what would that be? A uh, $400 billion a year in also physical infrastructure spending, which obviously this country really, really needs. So yeah, it's, Jesus it's like, Christ. it's like this, it's like the size of the military budget every year in like good human and physical infrastructure investment that could be happening over the course of the next half a decade and decade uh, that is on the line. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think progressives would tank it if it's like one and a half trillion, like Manchin's saying. So, mm -hmm. and I think Biden will be pushing for it really hard. Um, my favorite politician in the whole country right now is Ro Khanna because he, he does the best job at framing his side of the argument. And I think he does the best job at setting discourse. Republicans, oh, wait, is this have... an Indian guy? Um, I believe he's Indian. Yeah, he's a Hindu, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. Uh, he's like a S Silicon Valley congressman. I think we watched him do a debate with Ben Shapiro. Does this sound like a thing that ever happened? He did debate. It was like a 15-minute debate yeah. on minimum wage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Oh, I actually saw him have a conversation, and I was actually so happy now that it matters. But I was like, oh, my God, this guy has, like, at least a basic... Un he's not just saying, like, the normal yeah. dumb fuck talking points. He has, like, a basic understanding, at least, probably yeah. more. But he has, like, at least a basic understanding of, like, um, like econ. And it was really, really nice to, to listen to it. I was like, thank God. Yeah. No, he's got really strong uh, progressive sort of standing. He was actually the... He was the first Justice Democrat in Congress, if that means anything. Like, he was a very sort of frontwardly progressive politician he pre like the way he won was primarying a more conservative democrat uh -huh. um and he's been in congress for like i think six or seven years at this point and um what i was going to say was he's really good at framing the message i think republicans oftentimes uh get away with some pretty like toxic framing of things so like uh, for instance referring to like the estate tax as a death tax yeah. is an example of like or the really, obamacare really, really, really is like having framing. death camps and shit yeah yeah yeah, what death panels? Yeah, death exactly. Panels, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you're gonna lose your doctor, kind of stuff. And uh, Rokana has been like one of the most awesome framers in terms of this whole, uh, in terms of both defending progressives and pushing for Biden's agenda. So I think one thing that he started that really helped, I think, the human infrastructure element of this bill remain in place was him constantly every single time he takes like every interview that gets offered to him mm -hmm. every single time he'd get interviewed he'd say look it is not the progressives that are holding up president biden's agenda it is the moderates the progressives are step in line mm -hmm. with everything biden has proposed so far it is not us it's the moderate democrats and that actually caused people like you know, Chris Cuomo and MSNBC and these sort of left or, or left leaning media outlets to uh, put the pressure much more on moderate Democrats in a way that I don't think they've ever really felt before, because it's historically it's always been the progressives who don't want to do anything, but end up acquiescing in the end anyway. Yeah. Um, whereas this time it's it appears to be the exact opposite. And Ro Khanna got ahead of that framing um, very well. If there was a if there was a Democratic primary in 24 that didn't include Joe Biden, uh, I would I would I would say Ro Khanna would be like a pretty good choice um, if he could get the support. He's just a congressman, of course, but mm -hmm. um, you know he'd, he'd be a good one uh, overall. But yeah, yeah. All right, bud. Well, it was how, how late do you stream, man? It's late as fuck where I live. 
Um, I normally stream till 10 PST, um, but I just got home today and I started a little late, so I was like, oh, fuck, I'll stream a little later. Uh, I see, I see. All right, well, all right, but well, it was fun talking to you. Uh, I guess, uh, I guess you're about to get off from from the sounds of it, if that's the case. Yeah. Um, Is there? Wait, but, uh, real quick, for because you apparently you've seen some of my stuff. Is there any econ shit that you think I'm wrong about? That you disagree with? Um, I used to think that I disagreed with you on buying a house, but then I had to because I was like, I was considering messaging you and and talking to you about it. But then I, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna message Destiny. Like a lot of times when you debate people, it's just someone sending like a tweet that's like, "Hey, I disagree with you." And you're like, "All right, well, batters up, bitch! Mm -hmm. Like, you're, let's debate." And it's like, okay, well, if I'm gonna, if I can call Destiny out on something, I gotta be sure that I both know his position and know that he's wrong about it. But when I rewatched it, it seemed like what you were saying wasn't that, wasn't that renting is always better than buying. It was, it was like a buying a home. Though. Well, not that. I think what it seemed like what you were saying was that buying a home is not really the most effective way to build wealth if that is your like primary concern. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's ways to to build wealth uh, otherwise. Um, in terms of other economic takes uh, that you have that I would disagree with, um, hmm, that's a good question. Um, what, what do you think? Uh, the, what do you think the capital gains tax rate should be? Fuck, I have I think it should be higher for more revenue. Now, what should the exact number be? Some people have talked about matching capital gains with ordinary income, and that feels high from an emotional point of view. Um, I listened to a podcast with the Noah, no opinion guy and some economists talking about how yep. when it comes to like cashing out stocks and stuff, like capital gains is just part of the game. You kind of just factor that in. Um, and then I've also heard that it's like capital gains taxes are kind of like, it's almost like a double tax because this is already money that's, you know, been taxed one time. Um, I don't know. I think I think it would come down at the end of the day to seeing, I, I guess like maybe if there were more brackets for capital gains taxes, maybe I'd be a little bit more, because there are only two right now, right? No, there's it's like a stepladder. Well, when you say there's two, there's like I might be totally wrong. Maturity. Yeah, no, I, aren't there literally like two or three brackets? Am I crazy on this? I might be wrong. I gotta check. So the the way that I understand it is there's or, well, not the way I understand. The, the last I saw it, it was progressive step ladders for both, mm -hmm. but the matrix was uh, for like if you held the stock longer than a year. Oh yeah, like so long term holds. Yeah, this is the difference between like short, short term capital gains versus long term capital gains. So, um, Cause short term capital yep. gains is just gonna match your ordinary income, whatever it is. Um, for long term capital gains, so there's three There's three brackets. There's zero, 15 and 20%. I think if these were like maybe a little bit more step laddered, kind of like our federal taxes, maybe I'd feel like a little bit more warm to it. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I guess I guess my, my thoughts on capital gains so far is that so capital gains isn't really that effective at raising revenue anyway. Um, like a lot of socialists will defend the corporate tax not because it raises a lot of revenue, which it, it just doesn't and it and it never really has. Mm -hmm. Um but because it's uh, there there is like very select literature that says that corporate taxes are an effective way to reduce income inequality. Mm -hmm. Um which I mean honestly it could be true. It's Wait, can say that again? Capital not. gains are a very effective way to reduce income inequality? No, corporate taxes. I may have misspoke. Oh, oh so corporate like taxes. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm going to Yeah. Um, and there's very select literature which, which espouses that idea, and um, I haven't engaged very deeply with it, so I couldn't say it one way or the other. But what I, what I could say definitively is that based on the research that shows that not a trivial amount of corporate taxes are passed on to the consumer and to the worker... Um, you know, it's it's probably not as effective a way at reducing income inequality as a capital gains tax, mm -hmm. right? And uh, because you're actually taxing like the capital, you're taxing an actual distribution that's that's happening mm -hmm. and that's actually acted upon. And so, um, you know, I I'm not really as sold on a capital gains tax as like, oh, it's going to be ten percent of government revenue because it's not like it, you know, maybe five or six percent or something like that if it's like really raised. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think it would be an effective means of basically. Um, you could say taking like less circulating and uh, well, not circulatory, but like taking money that's less productive in the sense that it doesn't circulate as well, putting it into the government treasury and circulating that into hopefully, you know, sort of progressive government programs. Um, you know, 
to an extent, that's how the VAT tax gets justified as a, like a progressive tax. Because even though it's not a progressive tax, all is equal. Well, if you're like in Norway and you know, 30% of your state revenue comes in the form of a VAT tax, and that just goes immediately into funding like a crazily expansive welfare state. Well, I mean, if it raises the revenue, it raises the revenue. And if it pays for the programs that help needy and poor people the most, well, it pays for those programs, right? So mm -hmm. you, you can justify those types of taxes uh, in that way. Um, how do you feel about sin taxes? Um, I like them. I think they're good. They're regressive, but I don't care. I, I don't think I don't think something being regressive is necessarily a bad thing. Um, and I think sin taxes are one of those examples where like, eh, it could be regressive, but fuck it. All right. How about uh, amongst the different healthcare models, if you could snap your fingers and pick one of them, just implement it in the United States, which one would you pick? <sighs> um, based on my firsthand experience with European systems and the select literature I read when we were doing Medicare for All stuff, I think some form of multi-payer is good. So like a public option that everybody can like more or less either buy into or get into for free because they don't have the financial means otherwise with some sort of private layer on top if you choose to pay for it. I think it's I think it's fine. Yeah, we I guess we disagree on that, but I'm I'm instead of being a soft multi-payer advocate, I'm a, I'm a soft single-payer advocate, which you know, anytime I do a healthcare video or like a debate or anything like that, I try to mm -hmm. point out that um there's like three models and one of them is totally private, subsidized and heavily regulated insurance. That's what they have in Switzerland and in, other, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's it's equitable, it's affordable, um, and it's quality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's like multi-payer systems like France and Germany where you've got like kind of a public option, but then you can have private insurance competing, mm -hmm. which seems to work quite well. Uh, and then you've got like single-payer systems like Canada where they just pay for the insurance. And then single-payer systems like the UK where it's basically a nationalized industry. And like if you go to a hospital, it's not just the insurance, like basically the hospital those are all state employees that work there right yeah. so those are like the four systems and it turns out they can all work incredibly well but what doesn't work is whatever the fuck frankensteinian mishmash of shit we've got going on in the u.s where you've got like medicaid for like very poor people medicare for very old people uh, and then everyone else is kind of stuck in the middle like with this really inefficient and quasi unregulated insurance market um, that was part of what Obamacare did that was good. Um, but Obamacare is like a really, really like poor framework of what the Netherlands does with their health insurance. Um, and, uh, if we did something more like that, it would actually be very, very good. Um, so, you know, you, when talking to a socialist or a conservative person, it's just important to point out that like to the socialist, you can actually have a private health insurance system that's actually really, really good at extending care that's quality and equitable. Wait. Um, and when talking to a conservative, the opposite's true. I feel like I would challenge that. Is that true? Because like, I don't know if I would count Switzerland as anything <laughs> because it, like, isn't Switzerland literally the highest GDP per capita country in the world? I've been to Switzerland and it seems like a perfect country, um, but I feel like you gotta be pretty wealthy to live there. Like the scenery is beautiful, the public transit is perfect. I, like everything is. I don't think I don't think it's highest GDP per capita. You're probably thinking of like Luxembourg or like maybe Qatar or something like that. Um, sure. Don't get me wrong. Switzerland's obviously like a really rich country, um, but uh, the sort of the structure of the Swiss healthcare system is very similar to the structure of the Dutch healthcare system, which is just basically that companies compete nationwide and they're forced to compete on a single exchange. There's an enrollment period similar to Obamacare. It sounds very similar to Obamacare, like I'm describing, but. Mm -hmm. All insurance companies compete on the same exchange, unlike Obamacare. It's nationwide, not statewide. Uh, and what happens in those countries is that there's sort of a, like caps on what you can charge a person in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And in the Dutch system, everyone pays the exact same premium. So whether you're like an old person with diabetes or like a 22-year-old right out of college, you pay the same premium. There's no price discrimination. Interesting. Um, and right. for lower income people, there's like, if you're like super low income and you can't even pay like the 150 bucks a month or like whatever it comes out to, um, there's like subsidies basically for super low income people. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone has to buy insurance. So there's a mandate as well. So, you know, those, and, oh yeah. And the last thing is that the government negotiates directly with the insurance companies on how much they're allowed to raise the premiums each year. So there's a give and take on basically healthcare inflation 
mm -hmm. or health insurance inflation, I should say, each year. So yeah, wait, real those, quick. Those... Thank you for the raid, Cuba. This is a super boring conversation, but thanks. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Hey, uh, that know, was a, I try my best. No, no, it, that's not you. Their uh, their content is just a, <laughs> a little. I would say a little bit different than this. But okay, so I keep going. Now you're good. Um, and so the, those those systems are, you know, like I said, the the three prongs, you know, quality, uh, equitable, and affordable. They hit all three of them quite well. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, there's people in Switzerland, like leftist advocates in both these countries, that would be like, "No, you're fucking crazy." Like it's horrible single payer would be way better and it's like in part i would agree with them i am a single payer advocate but you know it's it's just a matter of like i, I don't i don't live in the netherlands i live in america mm -hmm. right and uh when i'm talking to a conservative um it, it the most important thing for me is to get them to realize that government involvement in a market does not mean that that market is less efficient mm -hmm. it sometimes means the opposite that markets are more efficient because of government regulation and involvement. Um, and insurance is, is probably the, like healthcare in general is probably the best example of that uh, overall, uh, I would say. Yeah, I think it seems like there's a lot of things um, that are kind of like endemic to healthcare that lend itself to not really being the best type of like free market that you would want. Um, like inability to price shop because there's not going to be 20 hospitals to choose from. Um, the yeah. the yeah the point at which you're like trying it's not to not perfect make a... information. Like mm -hmm. you don't know as much as a doctor does. Obviously, um, you know that you can't price shop like you said. There's it, there's like selectively inelastic demand. So mm -hmm. like if you have a heart attack, it's not like you have a fucking choice about getting the care that you need. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, there's all basically healthcare as a market is one that uniquely fails on almost like all levels of. I did a I did a video called like why the healthcare market fails and you learn in like your first econ 101 course what perfect competition is and sort of the pillars of it and healthcare fails on like every single one of those pillars mm -hmm. um and it's you know i guess it's not surprising to see that uh, in the u.s where we have a less regulated but also like selectively you know government administered healthcare system how it can be quite an inefficient uh an inefficient system i mean for a conservative all you have to mention uh, like I, I've never seen a conservative like convincingly argue against this case, which is the idea that um, even amongst the, like if you take Switzerland, which is the most expensive country amongst like developed economies in terms of healthcare spending per capita, mm -hmm. we still spend fifty percent more than them, and we don't have cheaper health insurance, and we don't necessarily have, have better, better outcomes. Out outcomes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the thing that always drives me the crazy is equitable distribution. Yeah, it drives me crazy that the, just because of how much we spend and how little we get for it, I think is the biggest thing that bothers me. Um, the only thing that I am not as familiar on, and I would have to do more research, or maybe you know the answer, is how much does U.S. healthcare spending subsidize our pharmaceutical market compared to the rest of the world? Like, how much does the world rely on U.S. research um, for? Yeah, for for like development of new drugs. There was a pretty good paper on this um and and i uh i could link it but i think it's i, I want to say it's it might actually be in that uh, healthcare market fail video that i did but um basically what this paper looked at and what it showed was that um the the answer to the question directly is that the u.s without a doubt uh produces like a shitload of the world's medical technologies and pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. uh, just you know straight up right and that's not really an arguable statement. But what this paper looked at was that uh, if you looked at that figure, like how like how much sort of pharmaceutical research spending there is in the U.S. Um, as a as a proportion of its GDP, it's not particularly different than any other country in the world. Like the reason the U.S. seems to innovate the most on healthcare and, and pharmaceuticals uh, is, is is the biggest, right? It's the most developed country, singular country. Uh, that spends the most because it's the biggest. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not like some, you know, component of U.S. regulation or economy that makes that so to to a sort of a certain extent. And so I think what that paper told me was that, um, well, number one, it's irrelevant because when we're talking about health insurance and healthcare, pharmaceuticals are usually separate anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no reason the pharmaceutical industry would change at all if we had like a single payer system. Um, like at all actually because it's it's just health insurance and then you got pharmaceuticals which is a totally separate industry talk about nationalizing the pharmaceutical industry that's a, te it's a separate conversation but mm -hmm. um even the most extreme example of like oh well what if we had like a basically a single payer like pharmaceutical system like the ndp proposed in canada well 
I'm not really convinced based on the data that uh, one pharmaceutical research would actually go down on the private sector. They're still incentivized to make these drugs mm -hmm. because two, the government would still have an incentive to have those drugs and research be created. So either in the form of like government contracts or, you know, prize pools uh, or simply being able to market your, your product. Um, I'm not really convinced that it, that that would lead to like a huge route in spending. Like for instance, um, who has the most innovative military in the world? Well, it's the U S why do we have the, why, why is that the case? Well, it's because we spend the most on it. Um, how could we have such an innovative military if it's a, a single national industry, you know, it's governments. Well, it's because we have private contractors that compete for bids mm -hmm. out of that U S sort of pocket of money. Um, and even in the case of a nationalized pharmaceutical industry, which to be fair, I'm not advocating for, um, I don't really see why that structure would be quite so different. Um, yeah. in my opinion, but the truth is every single pair system has a private pharmaceutical, you know, industry anyway, like the UK, Norway, Sweden, um, you know, Canada, they all have private uh, pharmaceutical industries uh, with private research and separate regulations. And um, I think that's what I would favor more so than, you know, like nationalizing both healthcare and pharmaceuticals at the same time. Because uh, the truth is, um, if you have just like government negotiated prices, you don't really need to nationalize that industry really at all. Right. I mean, it, yeah, because it, it'll it kind of take like care of itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a more virtue signaling kind of thing where it's like, oh, you know, I uh, like I, I just want to nationalize industry because it's like pharmaceuticals, you mm -hmm. know, and, and that's not. Yeah, or like the weird arguments come out where it's like you shouldn't have to pay for something you need to survive. And it's like, OK, but I think markets solve for like groceries like pretty well. Like I don't think and we need food to survive. You know? Yeah, uh -huh. well, exactly. Like there's, you know, I, it, that's exactly right. Yeah. And I think market, uh, you know, I. I don't know. I don't know how that kind of thing gets justified because because things like things like food and clothing and you know, stuff like that are like some of the maybe the most efficient markets that you could have mm -hmm. uh, ab absent government regulation. You still have a lot of government regulation and food and stuff, obviously, but um, it's it's quite an efficient uh, market. But oh, no, he, I, I don't I don't think. Yeah, sure. Go on. Here's a question I have for you, because um, I end up fighting with this all the time. Do you have a huge preference between like. Um, means tested versus universal programs um i guess i guess i, I guess to a certain extent it just depends on the program mm -hmm. like uh i'm a huge like forgive student loans guy but i'm also a huge it needs to be income based kind mm -hmm. of guy right because obviously if you're if you're if you're forgiving like 10,000 across the board for everyone that's not as efficient because like there's a lot of people who really, really need that forgiveness more than others. And also like the 10,000 of forgiveness for like, you know, a, a resident doctor is going to do a lot less for the economy than like 20,000 of forgiveness for like someone who like got their sociology degree. Yeah. yeah or, or like a teacher. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, I, to me, I think it should be income based um, or even like, you know, profession based. Like, mm -hmm. I, like I'd be OK if it's like, oh, if you're like a firefighter or, you know, a teacher or something um, or maybe like a federal employee, like maybe you'd be first priority or something like that, um, because it's it just doesn't circulate money as well to you know give money to a bunch of higher income sort of way super duper high potential earners. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do think that with a significant portion of programs, um, that it's it's justifiable it's i'm sorry it's justifiable to make them universal um because i think to a certain extent it makes them more robust um i know that in terms of education like if like free and universal education that's been shown to get cut back before because to be fair not everyone goes to college right so mm -hmm. not everyone has like an incentive to care about giving everyone free college right um and so you know that's one where I would advocate for free and universal college, but I'd also add in like uh, you know, trade school and technical training and community college and stuff like that as well to try and get more people interested in that kind of a program. But um, you know, I don't, I don't really see programs like Medicare or social security being better if they're means tested. It seems like a good thing that everyone has sort of a similar investment into these programs and that everyone pays into them and everyone takes out of them, assuming that you live long enough, obviously to, to take out of them, um, you know, especially for like 
basic welfare things like, you know, income supplement programs, healthcare programs, um, you know, f- uh, food supplement programs, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think there's a strong argument for those things being universal because everyone's need for those things is universal to a certain extent. Like everyone needs childcare. Everyone needs like, you know, uh, health insurance, right? Uh, you know, everyone needs, uh, you know, as much, you know, everyone needs food for instance. Um, you know, that, that's where like, you know, a, uh, you know, it, it, an interesting conversation is like regarding like a UBI mm-hmm. versus a negative income tax. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, um, I think that as, as a, as a means to get rid of welfare. So some people view UBI as a way to get rid of welfare, you know, sure. because it's like, Oh, simpler that's like than the negative framing bucks. of it. Well, that could be negative or positive. I know that some progressives, um, view it as like an attack on welfare, basically. Like they'll say like, Oh, yeah. you only want to do this cause you're trying to kill you know, welfare programs. Yeah, no, and it's true. It is true to a certain extent that, um, there's, there's a lot of people who receive more benefits in terms of their unemployment or their food stamps or their WIC or whatever it might be. Like the value of those benefits is more than a thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And so kicking those people off and putting them on a UBI, um, would be bad for them. Um, but, uh, if if your goal is like getting rid of if your goal is is basically to make sure you're replacing cash, everything that you've like kicked people off of at the very least right yeah. exactly if your goal like because i like the idea of an nit as a way to replace welfare if it's higher than a thousand dollars a month right if you if you if you have a negative income tax and like the the floor rate is like twenty five thousand dollars a year right mm-hmm. um well i mean like t- t- well call it $30,000 a year, like a living wage kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's more productive as a means of replacing welfare because you're giving everyone essentially, what would that be, uh, 2500 a month or something like that mm-hmm. um, in negative income tax, and that's money in their pocket that they can sort how they want. It's a more efficient way to sort dollars. It's market-oriented, right? If you're, you know, If you're poor, what's been shown is that if you get cash benefits as a poor person, it turns out that those people don't just go and buy liquor and drugs and go out and party with it. Like they buy food and diapers and, you know, things that you need. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, it, it's probably more efficient, uh, than like welfare, but, um, you know, a, a universal programs sometimes as a frame of like, Oh, it's just simpler to implement. Well, maybe it, it just depends on the exact nature of the programs and, 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 and what they're actually being spent on. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, I, some people have like a very dogmatic attachment to universal programs for kind of crazy reasons. Um, I think sometimes universal programs can be good. I think it depends. I feel like I've read a lot of negative things about universal education that having price tags um, attached to un- education seems to be beneficial. I'm most um, familiar with like the UK where initially they had it like completely free and then eventually they changed it to requiring uh, like just engaging in forms of price discrimination basically ensure that there's still access to education um, but you're collecting money where you can because the price tag for it becomes like so high that it's hard to fight for that funding on a yeah. political level basically but yeah I think yeah that yeah, universal education is a unique issue because I think and I don't know if this is the case across Europe like I don't know if this is the reason why maybe the education spending in the UK got out of hand but um in the U.S., if we had a universal education program that was like free at the point of service and mm-hmm. everyone just paid into it throughout their sort of working lives, um, we would have to wrestle with how colleges orient themselves. Uh, because the reason that like your the reason that your grandpa's college or your dad's college was you know fifty bucks a semester, so, you know those crazy low you know you see the bills from nineteen seventy on like my. Mm-hmm. My, you know, five classes cost $73, you know, yeah. and it's like, well, the reason is because, you know, back, you know, when the University of, you know, North Dakota or whatever the heck was Wait, in can the I, 1970s. Can I guess? Is, yeah, sure. Is it me. probably because the economic advantage conferred by these degrees was way, way, way less than just like working a trade or being like a normal wage worker? Uh, no, I actually, I don't, I don't think that's the biggest thing. I think the biggest thing is that. Um, when state level funding got cut from a lot of universities, Mm -hmm. um, 
and when college athletics became a much bigger thing as well, sort of additionally, um, universities started competing with uh, each other, not just in terms of the quality of their education, uh, but also uh, the student life that they could offer. You know, hey, don't don't go to some bullshit community college and you know small liberal arts school. Come to the you know University of Texas at Austin. We've got you know student housing and we've got two gyms on campus and we've got restaurants and we you know huge gigantic stadiums and stuff. And they offered more of like a complete package of the student experience rather oh, than sure. just going okay. to class and going home. Yeah, and so something that's I, really I mind that, blowing to a lot of Europeans um, is uh, U.S. state schools are fucking huge compared to like an average oh, yeah. European college. Um, and it's funny because like sometimes like if I'm streaming the early hours, like when I bring up like the gym in my fucking like state school, the University of Nebraska at Omaha, which nobody has heard of or knows about, is like a fucking like would be like one of the biggest like gym areas like in all of fucking Europe. And that's just like a no name yeah. shitter like state school. Um, yeah. Colleges in the United States are fucking massive. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, if you, if you, you know, like Texas A&M in, 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 uh, in Texas, uh, well, obviously where I'm from, yeah. um, you know, if you didn't uh, figure that out, uh, mm -hmm. Texas A&M is in Texas. Um, but Texas A&M, uh, they have like, they're the biggest, I think by enrollment college in the country. They have like over, they have like 70,000 students that go there mm -hmm. every year. Um, and, and, uh, College Station, the city where uh, Texas A&M is, is like a small rural town like this this town is only on the map because of the you know six figures almost of like student staff mm -hmm. and professors that, that go there every single semester um and if you look at like the bill if, 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 if you had a breakdown of the tuition and where it went and the student fees and where they go what you're going to find is a significant portion of it like i don't want to say like 50 percent or something but like i would say easily 20 to like 45 percent depending on the college is going to be um your athletics program which to be fair is revenue generating so mm -hmm. it's not like a total loss mm -hmm. but you know to a certain extent it's going to be subsidizing college athletics because almost every program is at some sort of a loss mm -hmm. um to a certain extent it's going to be like your parking fee and your student life fee and your rec center fee and your student center fee and like all these different fees that have to be paid for because the government, or not the government, because the university took out a bond to build a building and they passed a referendum to charge a fee for it so they could pay the bond interest. Like that, those are all the fees you're paying when, you know, you're a, you're a student. Um, and to a certain extent, it's also going to be all the services. Like my college had, um, had a career services department. Some individual, like my university had a career services department, but then sometimes like the engineering and business and class, like they had their own individual career services that had to be paid for. Um, all the career fairs that get put on, the the networking events, um, the the industry meetups, right? All the activities that are funded uh, by school. Obviously, the housing that I just mm -hmm. mentioned that you know wasn't a significant component back in the 1970s. So all of these things add up to like a really large portion of the cost of going to like a big major university. And so if the U.S. had university, or if the U.S. had universal college education. Um, I think the federal government would have to implement some sort of a like negotiation or price control thing where, you know, if, you know, if we're paying for all of your students tuition, we don't want to create some crazy moral hazard where you just build and build and build and start having these crazy exorbitant expenditures. And there probably needs to be more of a refocus on, you know, going to college isn't to have like the college experience. It needs to mostly be about getting an education. You know, not necessarily having like that sort of movie esque college experience because, um, you know, mark, you know, to a certain extent, it's a market and the market uh, sort of demanded that experience. And so uh, you pay for it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, uh, so that's, I think, I think that's why university, universal college in, in the United States is like a more complicated question than maybe in other countries. Because uh, sure. I guess, like you said, maybe in European countries, they don't have that problem. Like colleges are super small and still not really like focused on student life as much. And mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, I don't think college sports is really a thing in, in Europe either. So that's not really. A yeah. Thing. I'm sure you've seen like the map where I want to say like, it's like the highest paid government employees in every state and in like 35 states or whatever there, it's like the football coach or whatever. 
Oh yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I, I didn't go to like the biggest, well, I went to like a fairly large university, but like my, my university wasn't like in a big conference or anything. Our, our football team wasn't particularly good when I went, mm -hmm. uh, but I think our coach made like $4 million a year. He yep. made like, he made like four times what our chancellor made, mm -hmm. like the head of the university made less than the, than the football coach. Um, and, uh, probably honestly made less than the basketball coach too, because you know, got to pay the basketball coaches a pretty good amount as well. So, um, anyway, but that's, that's an interesting, uh, you know, little aside there. Any more questions? Any more questions? Um, I don't know. Not that I can think, think of unless chat can think of anything. All right. Well, if chat, I'll, I'll give chat maybe 10, 15 seconds to come up with some decent questions. If not, I'm going to, I'm going to ask if I can shout myself out and go to bed. Oh, so how do you feel about wealth safe. taxes? Wealth taxes are something that I need to look more into personally. Mm -hmm. um, so on one hand, you'll have, um, on one hand, people make the reasonable argument that well, everyone pays a wealth tax for the most part because we all pay property taxes, right? So maybe it's not as hard to implement. But I think that that's, like, there's a whole, like, infrastructure that's been developed over the course of, like, 100 years that determines the value of properties, and that's kind of where we see ourselves today, which is a little different than sort of trying to determine. And it's also a single asset, which makes it simpler. So mm -hmm. um, whereas if you if you had, like, my, my, my God, trying to determine, like, the exact net worth of all yeah. these millionaires, this is millionaires always, my really biggest hard. criticism is that like uh, tax should be relatively easy to levy and calculate and the like the irs is yeah. already horrendously underfunded and the and idea hard to of, avoid yeah and the idea of trying to get like agents to come to your house to start doing like audits and valuations of your of, of your net assets it just seems so unbelievably complicated i don't know it just seems like a disaster yeah, I think I th that, that's true. And I think uh, the other example that gets brought up a lot is Norway. So Norway has some sort of a wealth tax that they levy on like very wealthy <laughs> people. Um, but I haven't looked into the Norway example specifically. Um, mm -hmm. The truth is, is that um, I know that it looks, I, I know and I partially agree with the fact that it looks bad when a person is worth like $200 billion. Sure. Right, that to a certain yeah. extent, like Jeff Bezos has enough money to just end homelessness if he were to sell like ten percent of his stock. Right? I don't think that's. Um, I don't. I doubt that's remotely true. But I'll ex I'll accept the hyperbole. No, no. I I no. If you if you do the math on it, um, if you uh, if you assume a if you, you know there's half a million homeless people, and so you assume like say you're gonna build you know, a, a decent enough house and say that the total costs, construction, and everything, mm -hmm. say that it was a hundred grand because you're not building a crazy nice house for them. Uh, and then let's mm -hmm. say you've got to administer the program. So that's, you know, double the cost of that. And then let's say that you're going to give them like 50 grand a year, you know, each homeless person over, over two years to give them some more wraparound services. Well, that's, you know, that's uh 200, uh, or what would, it, what would it do the math on that? I think that's, is that 20 billion or 200 billion? I may have been off. I may have been off. I, I understand though, what but. you're saying, but I, I think that there are a couple of big problems. I, I think that the, the first one, which isn't really fair to bring up, so I'll just say as a side, is the political where I was will. off a of zero. It's 200 oh, okay. billion. The political will, yeah, the political will doesn't seem to be there for these types of expenditures. Um, but, but then also, more importantly, secondly, um, have you ever heard the stat that there's like, I'm making numbers up, but it's like, there's like, um, there's like 5 million homeless people in the US and there's 10 million empty houses. Have you ever heard this before or, or some like variation of this? I've number? heard the, 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 oh, there's six times the number of empty houses as there are homeless people. I've heard that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the, um, the problem with that is that when you start looking at maps of like where are the homeless people and then where are the empty houses, you start to understand a lot more that it's like, oh, okay. So like when we talk about like Jeff Bezos building houses, these houses would have to be where a lot of the homeless people are, which is going to be in places like LA, San Francisco, my, like big cities. So you're not going to be getting these like hundred thousand dollar houses. It's going to be significantly more expensive. And then there are other problems that go along with like funding these people with the money too. Like a lot, there's a lot of mental health issues. I want to say it's two times overrepresented in homeless yeah. population, might be higher. Um, it just, yeah, it's one of those issues where it well, seems that's like where, that's, mm -hmm. 
that's where the wraparound services come in, right? Yeah. Like you you would give someone access to like jobs training, mental health services, medications that they might be prescribed, you know, counseling, uh, you know, whatever they might need. Um, and the the point of bringing up that example, I was off on a zero. I do mm -hmm. uh, that's a mistake on my part, but um, obviously that you know the 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 prospect of the U.S. Let's say that it was, you know let's say it was 300 billion dollars to mm -hmm. like end homelessness right like, i feel like that's a fairly reasonable estimate right to either expand like homeless shelters or you know offer sort of joint apartments or something not necessarily building houses but let's say 300 billion dollars right well the prospect of the u.s spending 30 billion dollars over 10 years to like incredibly dent the homeless population is not infeasible and so I think that when people look at a guy like Jeff Bezos or Elon, or Elon Musk or, or, or Bill Gates that has, you know, just those three people combined have like almost half a trillion dollars of, of wealth, mm -hmm. right? I understand the frustration, right? But I also think that with a wealth tax, kind of where I'm at on it with my limited reading of, of the literature is that um, ultimately that money is just sitting there, right? And what you really care about is when Jeff Bezos sells the money and spends it. Mm -hmm. Like you don't necessarily care that his stock is worth $200 billion. What you care about is him buying like a hundred foot yacht, right? When he cashes out his stock and uses the money to do that. Now, sure. Although we get into weird you... issues there where it's like, do we ban the sale or purchase of like all luxury goods? Should all these be skewed in favor? No, of like, not at all. Right? But that, not at all. That's why I'm saying that you, you know, you might rather focus on the capital gains tax mm -hmm. if that's, your problem, right? That, well, who gives a shit if Jeff Bezos just wants to let his stock mature over time? I, you know, if you care about the lavish lifestyle that he lives and want to reduce income inequality, um, well, it's, it's capital gains tax. I mean, that's what you have to focus on. Make, you know, put a capital gains tax that's like 40% for anything over $10 million, right? And then all of a sudden, Jeff Bezos is going to pay like, I think he sells a billion dollars worth of stock a year. I mean, what is mm -hmm. You know, he's going to pay four hundred million dollars in in in. Uh, well, I'm assuming that the capital gain would be, you know, a billion dollars, I should say. So say five hundred million dollars of capital gain. You know, he's going to pay uh, two hundred million bucks in in uh, in taxes just on that one that one sale, assuming it happens all at once. And mm -hmm. so um, to me, that's that's like a more it's like a way easier way to determine the tax obligation because the market does the work for you. You don't have to, like, value the 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 stock before it's sold mm -hmm. um and right now honestly i think the treasury is coming up with like what i would say is an even worse idea than a wealth tax which is taxing unrealized gains which, well i mean that's like, what a wealth tax would ultimately do right like as i imagine any wealth tax is going to include like your stocks as an asset as part of your overall wealth right no because Stop no not really it's very different and it, because a wealth tax is like say i have say i have a portfolio of a hundred million dollars of like Tesla stock or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Um, well, if there's a wealth tax of one percent over fifty million, well, I'm gonna pay uh, what is that five million dollars in wealth tax, mm -hmm. right? Or no, uh, five five hundred million would be five million if it's one percent, right? I said fifty million. So oh, then it'd be five hundred thousand. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So I'm gonna pay 500,000 bucks in a wealth tax. So what the government's gonna do is they're gonna look at my stock. I made it easy for them. It's just stock sitting there. They know the mark to market. They're gonna say, hey, by December 31st, 2021, your stock was worth 100 million bucks. We're gonna charge you 1% fee after 50 million, 500,000 bucks. Easy enough, there you go. You know, there's your check as easy as possible, right? Now, the hard part on the unrealized gains is that it's not on the absolute value of your stock. It's only on like the unrealized portion of capital. And so you've got like a stock that matures at, say you bought the stock, say I bought the stock like 25 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. oh, well, Tesla. So say I bought the stock five years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And I've just let it sat there. I haven't sold it or anything. And let's say over the time I had an unrealized gain of like 800%. Mm -hmm. Well, now the government has to contend with the idea that I had this unrealized gain you know, over time, but I also had unrealized losses many, many years that I owned Tesla stock. And you're also not taxing the value of my entire portfolio anyway. You're just trying to tax like unrealized capital gains. And luckily for the government, I made that easy for them by owning public stock. Like, I don't know how this would work if, if you're taxing unrealized gains of like private equity 
um, or like private bonds or even public bonds, you know, stuff like that would be. Sounds like a nightmare I would say, to figure out. Yeah, to me, that seems like more of a nightmare than a wealth tax, which at least with a wealth tax, you have like a clear end goal, which is just total sort of net worth, mm -hmm. right? And unrealized gains, like how do you treat unrealized losses? Does every person have to report like a loss carry forward depending on their portfolio? Yeah. How does that affect capital markets, right? So like if someone, are people going to invest in like, you know, maybe are people going to invest in like less profitable companies because that saves them on the unrealized tax and then that distorts the market to a certain extent, but they or still I wonder, have like an asset. It would be really you know? exotic, but I wonder if you could found companies that have like cyclical, <laughs> like ups and downs based on trying to, to game the capital markets that or that like, exactly, the wealth like, yeah, like have, really like, weird distortions. If, yeah. Well, what if companies do like this J&J &J thing where they form like a shell corporation that absorbs all of their losses, but mm -hmm. nobody actually owns stock in that shell corporation, just mm -hmm. in the big, you know, regular corporation. So I think that taxing unrealized gains sounds like to me a much worse and more nightmarish idea than, mm -hmm. than a wealth tax. Um, I think the thing that bothers yeah. me the most um, about taxing unrealized gains too, is the idea that like you might be forcing people to sell off like a business to pay like on their yeah. unrealized appreciation well, a wealth, of it. a wealth tax could do the same thing. Yeah, it's another reason why I don't like wealth taxes either, up. yeah. I feel like people think about some of these taxes and they literally only think of like the ultra wealthy and it's like Bezos can pay it. And it's like, okay, yeah, but like, you know, there's a lot of people that might have like, um, you know, a lot of assets, but they have a lot of liabilities too yeah. and it's hard to figure out like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to be fair with the wealth tax, obviously if it's net worth and it's, you know, over like I think Warren suggested over 50 million, but if you just kept the over a billion rate that she proposed, like 3% yeah. over a billion, you know, maybe people would feel- be more, Yeah, but then at that point, like- Sympathy would be more justified. How much revenue are you actually raising off of this though at this point? Like it almost seems like you're, See, that's, you're that's taxing like problem. 400 people, you know? <laughs> well, that's the biggest problem is that what we said at the beginning of this, of this section was that um, taxes are really great uh, when, when obviously they're effective at collecting revenue. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're as, 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 as to the least extent possible distortionary of the market. Mm -hmm. um, they tax the people and things you want them to tax and that they're not hard, uh, that, that they're not uh, easy to avoid, mm -hmm. right? So this is why so many European countries like the VAT tax, yeah. right? Because how do you avoid a VAT tax? Yeah, it's you at every stage right? of production. You're going to be like, and it's your exactly. incentive. Every company is incentive along the supply chain to report the um, valuation increase accurately so that they can get like their tax liabilities and everything sorted out. Get their rebates as, mm -hmm. as well. And, and also it's it's just a tax on the sale price. So, I mean, there's no arguing about it. It's a very hard tax to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, with a wealth Yeah, tax, I didn't though, realize that like um, just on what you're saying, there is a, I, fuck, I wish I could remember the, the number, but compliance is a really big deal in the United States. And I think that it's like fairly low compared to other countries yep. where you run into these huge compliance issues. And there are some, I wonder what a percentage, I don't know this number at all, but like as somebody that's worked for small businesses in the past, your best customers are your cash customers because you don't report the income. <laughs> and I super wonder how many companies get away with like, under reporting or not report, or like how many servers, for instance, don't report their tips, right? I remember working, people were like, oh, is a server? Oh, you only have to report 10% of your tips. You only have to report 8% of your tips. That's what they can, 8% yeah. of that paycheck or whatever. Yeah. And like people, like there are, there are a lot of people that legitimately believe that's like the tax law. Like as long as I report 8% of my sales as tips, like I'm good, like no, you're supposed to report everything you get. Um, and yeah, the compliance is a huge issue in the United States. So making like complicated taxes yeah. is only gonna further like decrease. Because we don't, we don't, like there's been a, a we don't we don't have an incredibly well funded IRS mm -hmm. right and uh, that's part of the Biden sort of budget plan giving the IRS a buttload of money uh, to sort of better equip itself to enforce these laws but even if it were to do that I mean just just again to be fair I haven't engaged in a lot of literature these are just this is just conjecture but I think it's valuable it's just that if you're taxing like say three percent over a billion net worth right so you're talking like you said you're talking like a few hundred people or families that you're taxing. This is not a big group of people, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just that it's a small group of people. These are literally the wealthiest, most powerful people, 
I'm not saying to be scared of them or anything like that, mm -hmm. but these are the people who have the easiest ability to just leave the fucking country. That tax they don't want base. to pay the wealth tax. It also taxes or, or the data that if they just want to hire like collect, which a is team the most of Harvard educated lawyers economy. to fight the IRS in court for three years until the you know, IRS eventually just gives up, mm -hmm. right? One thing that happens in a lot of government processes, especially federal processes, is um, the lack of enforcement is explicitly due to a lack of resource to go after that type of thing, right? Yeah. Where, um, like I know uh, from a friend that I have, um, it happens in security clearance processes a lot, right? Like one of the reasons that you can be honest during a security clearance um, is because, well, one, they want you to be honest. They don't want you to, to be lying to them, number one. So if they prosecuted you for telling the truth, that'd be one thing. But also, uh, even if you uh, are, are, even if you report like really egregious things during your security clearance process, oftentimes you won't get prosecuted for it um, because that agency, it's like, it's just not worth it to them, right? It's not worth like the headache, all the paperwork, you know, all the stuff that they'd have to go through um, in order to prosecute it. And I think that a similar problem would happen with the IRS. Like, does the IRS want to take on like, the Walton, Bezos, Musk, like every single wealthy family all at once when they would inevitably challenge the valuations of their assets in court. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. And, and uh, you know, to be frank, I don't know if uh, they would have the, th this would be an annual occurrence. Yeah. Every single year, there'd be a new suit filed by like every single billionaire. Um, and, you know, to, to a certain extent, uh, again, not saying you should be scared of them, but it's just the idea that, um, they have the resources at their disposal to do this and really like bog the system down. And if you've got capital gains taxes at your disposal anyway, use why... the tools that work and just increase the money. You're raising yeah, right exactly. You know, so, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm fairly skeptical on a wealth tax. Um, but to be fair for like the 10th time, uh, haven't engaged in the literature as much. Um, cause like, while at the same time Norway has a wealth tax, I know that like France used to have a wealth tax, but they got rid of it. Yeah, a lot of they countries. They got rid of it because it was yeah fucking super hard to you know to implement basically. So uh, that that's uh, you know that's that's the wealth tax in a in a in a nutshell, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, oh, here's a final question. Do you think the estate tax should um, that like uh, forgiveness? or the um, exemption should be decreased to like $1 million. Why is it so high? Um, well, it's it's probably high. It's probably more politically why it's high. I'm not sure if there's like an economic reason. Oh, gotcha. Um, it politically makes sense, I guess. Like I gotta understand yeah, leaving like a million dollars like to my kids basically free, but like, dude, $11 million, like combined, that combined with the step up in basis just seems like pretty stupid. Like, I don't know why it's, it's it just seems unnecessarily high. Yeah, I think, I think, um, you know, you've seen, you've seen some countries move away from the estate tax. Like I think Sweden recently got rid of their estate tax. Um, and I don't know the rationale for why Sweden did it to be fair, but I mean, there's a certain logic where it's like, well, if I'm, if I'm giving like a non-cash benefit to someone, should that be taxed um, if they don't sell it off, right? So, like, um, if if I have, like, 10, you know, if I have 10, like, Microsoft stocks or something mm -hmm. and I die and I transfer that to, like, my cousin, um, you know, his wealth has gone up. He's got 10 Microsoft stocks but mm -hmm. um, that he didn't have before. But, but it's also not material wealth at the same time, right? That he's, is true, not, but... Like, spended it. I, I, I like, are you, you're, fam are you familiar with like how step up and basis works? The way that I understand it is basically that, uh, if I bought, like, say I bought like a stock in the 1970s mm -hmm. and I owned it until I died in 2021, um, the step up basically says, if I give that to my son, mm -hmm. he, the capital gain associated with it, the tax that he would actually be levied wouldn't be based on the buy price of 1970 it would be based on as if he bought it the year that i died yeah so i like the idea of step up in basis because the stepped up basis creates a taxable event at death i think it's probably better to have taxable events at death rather than like there are stocks that people have owned since the like 1950s that they've never had to pay capital gains on just because they haven't sold them and they can like borrow against it and do all kinds of other weird shit so i think i'm i think i'm okay with like 
you know, your dad has a bunch of stocks he bought in the 80s, he transfers them to you when he dies, but you know, on death, in order to accomplish that step up in basis, there, there's like a taxable event there where you have to pay capital gains on it before you transfer it over. I think I'm okay with that, just because it seems weird to have like taxes dating, or I, I guess like um, untaxed gains dating so far back. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm personally not, you know, I'm not against the estate tax. I think that the logic of getting rid of it is, is, it seems to be what I just said, just the idea that um, if, you know, if you're concerned about someone sort of, you know, increasing their actual material sort of condition in a way that is unearned, then mm -hmm. you would rather tax the actual expenditure um, or sell or sale of that asset rather than just the gift of that asset. Well, I think um, so. The, pro the only problem with only taxing the, um, with only taxing the, um, the realized gain is that now people have kind of like clever loan schemes to escape the liquidation of assets and still being able to derive massive value of them. Like you're getting these secured loans basically from all these banks now where it's like, if I've got a portfolio of $10 million, I never really have to um, realize any gains. I could just take out, you know, a $200,000 loan or, or a $2 million loan and like pay it back over time with due credit. Um, and I, and I can keep my, my taxable income very low because my, my salary might only be right. like 200K. Um, and then I, yeah. So, I, I can understand. Well, you're, you're yeah. paying mm -hmm. you're you're paying back that loan with after tax income, though, right? Yeah, that is true. Um, yeah, fuck, or that's my argument. Never mind. No, I've used that argument before. Selling, that's true. Because because people selling. would say that you can do that, but I guess like at the very least, because technically everything you pay it back with is is going to be um, post tax income. Um, my next argument, my response to you would be that is true, but you can smooth out your taxable events like very finely because of your income, but then your response to me would be, well, you could just sell like a really small amount of stock, so you're essentially achieving the same thing, right? Yeah, and yeah. I, you know, I, there's, a, there's a strong argument if you're giving someone like a car or an airplane or a boat mm -hmm. or a house, right, that, that, that you should be taxed on that because that, that is in a, in a very real sense, um, you know, affecting your sort of physical material condition um, in an unearned way, just by the by way of your family members dying, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe that should be taxed, right? So the the stock example is kind of an unfair example. It's one of the reasons that I would say broadly, I'm I'm in favor of keeping the estate tax uh, around. Really, I'm just trying to provide the logic because when, when when people <laughs> I think I think whenever Nordic countries do anything that's not like seemingly the most possible progressive thing, it's used in very toxic ways during discourse. So like. Conservatives will say like, oh, Nordic countries don't have a minimum wage, right? Mm -hmm. But then, you know, leftists might say, well, you know, even those sock them countries have really high wealth inequality. And it's like, okay, well, there's a lot of nuance to both of those yeah. statements. And so Sweden get, getting rid of the estate tax, I, it's probably less so that they're acquiescing to like the Swedish elite billionaire class or something. And it's probably more so just to do with like a simplification of the tax scheme and you know, maybe they made the revenue up somewhere else or something, or maybe mm -hmm. it was part of like a governing coalition agreement. Um, you know, things like that. But the estate tax is pretty interesting. It's, it's also, to be fair, one of those taxes that ultimately just, it doesn't, it's not like it produces a lot of revenue. It's it's just a tax that in theory would reduce income inequality um, if, if it was levied in a progressive enough basis. But sure. Um, but all right. All okay. right. Last question. You, you, you promised the last question. Uh, it's been a really fun conversation, though. Uh -huh. um, and, what are you uh, East Coast if, if you or? I'm actually Central Time, so it's literally like almost okay, four gotcha. in the morning. <laughs> Three, four, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I got to get up uh, about eight o'clock and, and do a report in the morning. Uh, but uh, this was worth it. This was fun for me, obviously, so I don't regret it at all. Um, it was it was fun talking to you. I've been watching you for uh, probably since 2016 or something like that. Like probably since I like uh, first started college, I should say. Um, and uh, my friend actually recommended me to you. He's been a, a chatter since your StarCraft days. So he, he's been uh, he's been around for, for quite a long time, I guess. Um, so it was fun talking. Uh, do you mind if I sort of shout myself out and, and, uh, and head out? Yeah, I guess I'm out. All righty, people. So uh, you're listening to me and Destiny Talk. I'm a Kano boy. Uh, I guess he watched uh, my debate with Vosh, uh, which I did. You know, I feel like I did okay in. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in learning about sort of economics uh, from a progressive capitalist perspective, 
um, you know, come over to my channel. If you've ever had a question like, you know, uh, is capitalism coercive? What should the corporate tax rate be? What is quantitative easing? Um, should we have sin taxes, you know, taxes on like uh, cigarettes or marijuana or alcohol, stuff like that? Um, try to answer all those questions in scripted videos. And I also have debates and discussions like this. So if you're interested in that, Econo Boy on YouTube, it's Econo and then B-O-I on the very end. And I guess you can follow my Twitter and stuff like that. Uh, and Destiny, it was, it was fun talking to you. Thanks for letting me on. Yeah, thanks a lot. Sure, you hear me say dumb econ stuff. Um, you can always scream at me on, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll be sure to reach out if you ever say some dumb shit. All right. Cool. Have a good one, buddy. All right. You too. Bye. What a cringe nerd. Fuck. Got him. Okay. Well, fuck. My stream's gonna be late tomorrow because I got a gym in the morning. So good luck. We'll be. I think we might. Might just do Darkest Dungeon 2 tomorrow if it's coming out. If it is out, I think it is, so. Comfy Stream DGGL. Westerners rise up and defeat the tyranny of the Taliban. Okay. I love you guys. It's been fun. I'm fucking tired. I'm going to react to Ben vs. Charlie Kirk tomorrow. Oh god, oh yeah, I still have that one open. We didn't even... Watch Stardust, here you go. She's okay. And I don't like to, I don't want to give out. We support strong women of color here. All right, Ripper in a cappuccino, 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 my dude, who knows? I will catch you guys tomorrow right now. Be careful, okay? No! Oh, I should have plugged my VPN. Fuck. We'll do it tomorrow. No, canceling. Hey! Listen up. It's late. Are you sleeping in a foreign country right now? And all you want to do is watch your favorite HBO or Showtime or Amazon Prime or Netflix or Hulu shows and you can't do it because that country for whatever reason blocks your traffic? Check out surfshark.deals slash destiny, okay? Go ahead and get three months extra free, 83% off, okay? Log in VPN anywhere across any device. Watch your favorite shows, programs anywhere in the world, even from out of this world. I bet if you were on one of those space station rides or whatever, I bet it would even work up there, okay? Hop on that Elon Musk satellite internet, all right? Fuck her dad. So, hey! Calm down, Stu, okay? Um, but if you did want to have a private conversation with your dad and your mom was trying to monitor your internet traffic, all right, guess what? Hop on that VPN. She can check those router logs all she wants. All she'll see is connect is you connecting to your absolutely secure, non-log-keeping Surfshark.deals servers okay she's not gonna know anything about what's up okay so have fun check that out be careful guys <clears throat> okay did you get the ad clip from earlier yes somebody emailed message me on discord aiden did good job send me another one okay i love you guys it's been fun rip on peace out